welcome to the 12th episode of Friday Nightmares. I am one half of your hosting team this evening, Heather Powell, coming to you from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And joining me is... Scott Crawford, recording in my horror basement in uh, Swartz Creek, Michigan, because dear God, it is way too hot and I got to stay in the cool area. And with how buff and hot Scott's getting, his new nickname is going to be like Smoke Show Crawford. Yeah. Well, right now it's Crawl Space Crawford, apparently. <laughs> Crawl Space Crawford. <laughs> Scott was just flexing his huge biceps, and oh, I want to buy me some tickets to the gun show. <laughs> this gun show is you know open what? for all. You do look like we should switch the video. Maybe we could do some Patreon because you look like you actually got some development going on there and those upper body, those biceps. I don't, I don't know how since that's all I've been doing is walking. You haven't been doing your push-ups anymore? <laughs> I did it. Well, I didn't this week. I need to get back into it. Kind of fell off. Mm -hmm. Fell I'm off slacking. the wagon. July yeah. 4th knocked you off the wagon. <laughs> Pretty much. I, I'm free. The, you know, the freedom was ringing through me, so I just had to. <laughs> America. Mark. I had to take, I just had to be free for a whole so, week. So, speaking of my brothers and sisters from America, so on July 4th, I uh, took myself out to Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, and it was quiet for a July 4th. It was still very, very busy with a lot of Canadians, but obviously with the essential uh, border only being open for essential travel, there was no Americans there for the tourism of the, of the holidays. So... I went to Margaritaville <laughs> nice. and had myself a good time and uh, had some really yum yum drinks. Uh, the strawberry mo mojito is one that I strongly recommend for anyone if they ever go to Margaritaville. And I went and watched your fireworks. And let me tell you, you guys, eventually I left because it was 45 minutes in. And I was <laughs> like, okay, guys, well, like, I get it. Like, bombs bursting in air. You're not fucking around. Like, no. No rest for the wicked. No, like, if we're going to do something, we're just going to go all out, especially when our cities are not like doing their own 4th of July fireworks. So it's left up to the citizens to uh, celebrate themselves. And in Michigan State, but I actually think in New York State, they were allowed to. Oh, you because think Because so? the ones that we saw, you got to remember, I was watching it. Now, I know you've never been to Niagara, but there's the Niagara River that separates us from the city of Buffalo. So Niagara Falls across the way from the American Falls and, and Buffalo. And I could clearly see the fireworks. So for me to be that far away, like miles and miles away, and being able to clearly see them, I think the state of New York was allowing fireworks, but I don't think there was any fireworks over the American Falls, but there could have been because there were fireworks that started right at nine or 9.30 when it got dark, and they just kept going. Like, one would end, and another one would begin. Yeah. Like, you guys just go all night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, like I was saying, because, like, only the city, like, for here in Michigan, the uh, main cities like Flint, Bay City, Saginaw, they didn't do their own fireworks show, but, you know, fireworks were allowed to be launched off by anybody here in the town or in the state. And, yeah, when I, was, I went to my cousin's house to a cookout, and... Cookout. I was waiting for you to say that. <laughs> Not a BBQ. No, a cookout. Well, no, because there's no barbecue sauce. Nothing was barbecued. It was burgers and brats. There was no barbecue sauce? What are you? Nope. Like, well, that, that, I blame my cousin on that one because usually when I'm cooking, there's at least some barbecue sauce somewhere. Oh, man. Sounds like an unsaucy event to me. Well, I was pretty sauced, but <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'm proud of you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, it was crazy because we, uh, we, probably like uh we all chipped in and got about 300 something dollars with the fireworks our buddy john doe ended up picking him up and like loading his whole entire truck did you say his name is john doe well his real name is john but we all call, call him john doe i was gonna be like that is fucking jokes if that's his actual <laughs> name no it's just uh that's just our nickname for him but uh yeah we lo we were launching off some fireworks and the next thing you know like 12 different neighbors around my cousin's house were launching fireworks so there was like we were surrounded at all sides, no matter which way I turned. There was the bald eagles show up all of a sudden. Yeah, everywhere they landed, <laughs> they landed and were rooting for us and everything. <laughs> That's amazing. Uncle Sam was there, pointing that he's like proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Canada Day here, we had fireworks too. It was funny because the sale of, can of fireworks are banned, and I was 
listening back to our zombie episode because I like to listen to myself to see how I can improve. And um, yeah, there were fireworks, like not by the city or anything like that, but people, I guess, I don't know. I don't know where they got them from, Amazon or I guess maybe they stored them from last year. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe there's a black market for fireworks. I have no idea. Yeah, and yeah, I was going to say they must have stored them. Right? So it was, um, people were still able to celebrate Canada Day. I had a water balloon fight that day. Uh, it was pretty Which mad. looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I kept trying to smash my friend with the, <laughs> that sounds good, with the water balloon. <laughs> And it wouldn't break on her. I had to hit the ground. So I must have bruised her like three or four times because I kept whipping the matter. And I'm like, oh, it's not working. And then we went to the Bird Kingdom on the Thursday with my with my friend's kids. And probably the best days, we had a beach day. And we went with just the girls and my friend's four-year-old daughter was there. And so my friend um, always refers to myself as Auntie Heather and my other friend Anne is Auntie Anne. And Aurora, her daughter, and I were out in the water because I'm the only one that will actually go in the lake. The other two will kind of wait there, but they won't actually go in the water. And she told Aurora told me that I was her new best friend. <laughs> I was her favorite, <laughs> and I thought my friend Anne was gonna have a meltdown. But anyway, um, wonderful, wonderful times going on this summer. Things are getting a little bit back to normal here in Ontario. We've slowly been moving into phase three. Um, our premier has done a really good job, I think, of managing the situation. Our cases are still very low here, uh, especially where I live. Um, yeah, so hopefully wish you guys will have the same thing happen to you eventually. Let's say, wish I could say the fucking same. Yeah, because <laughs> it's it's been a much smoother transition. I'll be honest, in Ontario, like like Toronto is obviously bad, and they mandate ma- mandatory that you have to wear masks inside and on public transit. But where I live, like less than one percent of the population has COVID or has had it and even now the numbers are dropping more and more and more so like obviously I wear a mask inside if you know the store requires it or if I'm in a situation where I can't social distance or it's busy or whatever um right. but it's not nearly as prominent I would say as it is in places in the states yeah because unfortunately for Michigan like we were just talking about just last week how everything was opened up or last episode how everything was opening up and it was getting exciting well our cases started shooting back up. We're at like 400 something cases a day now. And our governor was like, well, I'm seeing a uh, resemblance of what's happening in the Southern states. So we are coming back from phase four and going back to phase three, shutting down the bars to only be allowed to serve alcohol on patios and, uh, and to go cups, but not allowed to actually have people inside the bar. See, we weren't allowed to have people in bars either. We still aren't. Um, yeah that's crazy yeah like but in all fairness why are we still moving forward and why do we have less cases you know like i don't mean to be like finger wagging here but because it's been such a slow transition and we let different regions come into it like as i said i don't love the premier i didn't vote for him and i seriously doubt i would vote for him again just because we have polarizing values we're not allowed to sit in restaurants yet and there's a reason why Right. So when phase three comes and that happens, still things will be gradual. And I think that I think your mission at governor is smart, but I think the U.S. just needs to calm down mm-hmm. because the longer this keeps up, the longer borders will be closed for tourism yeah. with Canada. And that really sucks for both of our countries. So. Right. And yeah, it's and our president's not making it any better. Yeah. But you know what? You're going to have Kanye West soon. All of the lights in here. Oh, my God. Oh my gonna, like, god! Be like, Jesus walks. <laughs> Jesus walks with me. So, yeah, Kanye West. Lord help us. <laughs> 20, 2020 Kanye West. This is this is your time to shine, Scott. If this Buy happens, all the Kanye CDs you can. If this happens, I'm swimming across Niagara. If I drown, so be it. But I'm <laughs> not, not across Niagara, Scott. That's where the falls are. I know. <laughs> I, Maybe that's in how your desperate. area. <laughs> <laughs> That's how desperate I am to get out of here. I'll chance it. <laughs> You'll be that new video. Because there's a video of a kid going over the falls in the 70s and survived. He I heard about that. Falls and he got picked up by Made of the Mist. There's a movie in Niagara Falls once, uh, in 2021 when you come here. I'll go and I'll take you to the movie theater that it's, offered, that it's played at. And every time I watch this movie, I still tear up. Like, I know the kid's going to be fine. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like crying <laughs> in the theater. Oh, my God. It gets all the feels going. So. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> right. 
anyway let's get into these movies like let's stop fucking around you know that's what people came here for they came here for we're no exploding heads okay we can't cock and ball talk for like 20 20 minutes (laughs) i probably could cock and ball talk for at least a good 40 but um, true true but but, you know exploding heads does it better we're gonna save that for when brandon orlick's our guest you and him can can do that together Oh, that'll be some good sexy times. Amazing. It'll be like the date. That's what the actual date is. <laughs> he orders pizza for himself and he goes on Zoom with the two people that win. <laughs> anyway, no one knows what we're talking about, but if you're a fan of Exploding Heads and you're on their Patreon page, you've heard about this ongoing, um, I guess, I don't know, joke or whatever you want to say about it, winning a date with Brandon Orlick, who's a single Exploding Head. So Scott and I have both thrown our hats in the ring. <laughs> Damn isn't, right we have. Isn't Scott's a pretty aggressive man? Like I don't know with those guns and that <laughs> smoke show over there. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what I have to offer. Like he's just all up in it. It's great. I know. <laughs> Too sexy for my shirt. So oh, oh yeah, I better take it off. Oh, yeah. No, no, not till we're on Patreon. Not till oh, we're on oh, Patreon. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, no, <laughs> for our five cents <laughs> skipping that you're gonna get. Yeah, right. right. Let's, start, let's start with this first movie. I don't think you saw this one. No, I have not been able to find this one anywhere. Mm, that's just too bad. Uh, yeah, here goes the cockiness. Yeah. Anyway, the movie that we're referring to is Alive 2020. And this movie was brought to us by Mark Nato from the Rotten Round Table. And he owns it and he shared it with me, which was very kind of him, basically letting a friend borrow a movie. And wow, what an interesting concept. So I. If you can find this, uh, my American brothers and sisters and Canadian brothers and sisters, it is a really, really cool concept. These two people wake up in this makeshift, I guess you could say hospital beds, and they're obviously in a lot of pain. Some some shit's gone down, and they don't know why they're there, and there's this doctor, in quotations, tending to them, and and the kind of the, it goes from there, right? So it goes from this doctor, quote unquote, doing activities to help them, which really are, is not helping them. And also these characters trying to figure out who they are, how they got there. It's, it's really good. I'm pretty sure it's low budget. I don't think that it had a huge budget coming into it, but it uses its money well. And it's currently sitting at number eight out of 94 movies. Yeah. of 2020 so that tells you how much i enjoyed it and it has a very realistic ending um yeah, reminded this, me a little bit of patchwork yeah this is one i definitely want to check because mark nato was talking about it highly and then seeing you put it at number eight on your top 10 i'm going okay i really need to see this movie yeah, and i don't even know what genre to put it in it's not really a slasher it's not i don't know i you will have to watch it and tell me because i'm not that good at genres and stuff like that um it's a good movie it's solid it's entertaining but i don't know where i would put it so yeah check it out when you get a chance to oh i definitely will that's, that's definitely on my list someday <laughs> uh so yeah the next one uh you and i have both seen this one um and it is a shutter exclusive called metamorphosis uh directed by kim hong soon which is a south korean horror film uh Synopsis says an evil spirit that changes faces infiltrates one family, placing one brother in danger while the other tries to save him. And holy crap, I was really impressed with this film. Like, this is probably my second favorite exorcism film I've ever seen, right next to The Exorcist. Yeah, I think besides The Exorcist, this is the best one that I've seen. Yeah, this one was... My, that I've seen. Now, there may be yeah. better ones out there, so I want to clarify that. But the best one, the best second best one I have witnessed, and I've watched a lot this year. This it's a popular genre. Like there's a lot of not so good ones. <laughs> right. So you know maybe there's some better ones that I just need to be exposed to them. Oh, the exorcism, exorcism of Emily Rose was pretty good. Actually. Yeah, that's one that I have not seen. Yeah, that's pretty good. So I would have it up there with that. But I still like this one more than that one. And oh, that nice. one's pretty good. Like that one I enjoyed quite a bit. Yeah, this one I just I really enjoyed the characters. Uh, the story was very, uh, very interesting, kept me glued from the very beginning, and, like, it's very freaking creepy and haunting. Very much so, and the the storytelling, it's a long movie. Yeah, it's like about It's an hour hours. and 50 minutes, but the storytelling is so well done, and the character development, and how you get invested with the family who's being affected and the priest that's involved in the situation is incredible. And there were scenes where I was 
not yelling at the screen, but thinking, no, that's not, no, like, don't do it. That's not who that is. Like you as the audience get privileged to information that you kind of know that the characters don't. And I always right. find that really, like, there's some movies that do that well. And then there's some movies that don't do it well. This one really does. And for me, it was a refresh, a refreshing film. And it's number 10 on my list right now. Yep. Same here. It's my, my number 10 as well. And yeah, I'm, I was very, very impressed with everything about this film. So the next one, and we're, and this was on Shutter, it's a Shutter exclusive, and yeah. you had it in the States and I had it here in Canada. So the next one that I watched was Yummy, and you had seen Yummy. Oh, I had. You watched it for uh, our zombie film, so I just hadn't got around to watching it, more or less because I didn't have access to it. So I know you already talked about it. I don't really need to beat a dead horse. Well, but no, like, I didn't talk about was, it on our last episode. But then you talk about it on what you've been watching? I don't think I did. Uh, I don't know. We could go back in time and see. But anyway, it's a short little zombie movie. It's not too long. 96 minutes running time. And I believe that it's directed in Eastern European Hospital. But what language were they speaking? Was uh, it Russian? No, Probably it was uh, Danish, I think it was. It was Danish. Okay. And as you, I feel like you stated this before, a young lady is going in for a breast rejection at this hospital and shit goes down and an infection breaks out. And it's you really get into the characters. Like you really are rooting for these characters and wanting for them to survive. It's a very, I don't think they had tons of money filming this either, but yet again, they use their money well. The effects were done well. It, it moves quick for an infection movie, which is what you want. There's yeah. enough character development that you care. And then it moves quick. It reminds me a lot of 28 Days Later. It had the same feel to me as 28 Days Later. Now they, that's just me, but that's what I felt that it was similar to. Yeah, I'll say like the infection way it was reminded me of uh, 28 Days Later. And then I would say that the gross out and the gore stuff in this film was very reminiscent of Dead Alive in a way. Mm. I was more or less thinking of the character development and the interactions yeah. and how they follow the characters through. It reminded me very much. There's a way that 28 Days Later is filmed and the way they capture the characters and what they're experiencing. That is, I feel they're unique to that film. And that really was reflected here. And I haven't seen Dead Alive, so I can't speak to the to the uh, to the grotesque of this. But there was definitely some like really really gory scenes in it for sure. Yeah, some gory scenes and just some kind of disgusting scenes since this is in a plastic surgery center. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, uh, yeah, a hospital, right? And mm. you you do feel bad even for who I guess could be considered an antagonist. You still feel kind of bad for the individual. Um, I'm thinking about the doctor that was involved yeah. and it's still like good, good film. Like if you haven't watched it on shutter yet, I strongly recommend checking it out. I don't think it's, you're going to feel like it's a waste of your time. Yeah. Cause this is probably one of my favorite zombie movies of this year. And it's my number eight right now. Oh, wow. I think for me, let's see here. My, it's you a little bit higher. I had in my twenties. I, I did enjoy it, but there's just other films that I connected with more, but yeah, it was a good film. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's also a bit of a comedy too. So there's some funny moments, but it's played more serious with. See, this is where comedy. where Scott doesn't really have a sense of humor because <laughs> the comedy is pretty dark. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, it's definitely dark. <laughs> like it's very dark and morbid humor, but it's comedy. And Scott's like, oh, they all died. <laughs> Oh, that was funny. <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> no hope. <laughs> this is the way I like life. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's definitely worth the watch on Shutter for sure. Yeah, highly, highly recommend. Um, and another one that I would recommend because it's just a very unique setting and kind of fun would be the uh, 2020 slasher film called Aqua Slash. And this is about a bunch of, I'm guessing it was college kids. Are... I think they graduated high school. Was it? Were they supposed to be high school? Yeah, I think they were graduating high school because they were talking about going to college, but yet they were all doing blow. Which I find, like, that is, like, the popular drug now. Everyone does blow. Like, it's just a thing. But anyway, I digress. But yeah, it's, like, pretty much, like, their graduation party. They go to this uh, big water park where apparently, like, 30 years ago or 36 years ago, uh, a terrible ha thing happened there. And, yep, it's pretty much just, like, plays out like a slasher film. But, man, the third act goes just pretty insane balls to the walls yes i would say that leading this almost followed an 80s slasher formula 
yeah. a lot of character development at the beginning. You get a kill very early on. Yep. And you kind of get a couple of minor kills throughout it. I think there's only two before the major one. And then the final third act, I, I kind of felt like the movie is short. It's 87 minutes, and it feels shorter than 87 minutes. Yeah, it does. Um, I think it, they could have probably added some more kills, but I think they worked with what they could do, and they did it well. And I, and I don't have a criticism for that. I think the final third act is so elaborate and well done that it really does make up for anything that could be lacking. Better an awesome kick-ass third act than some half-ass shitty kills with maybe one good one, in my opinion. Yeah, I completely agree because, yep, the build-up for to that third act is what makes this completely worth it. Like, the character development's fun and great, too. Like, everything, like, I enjoyed a lot about this movie. It's like, I wouldn't say it's going to be, like, in my top ten or anything, but it's, yeah, I still thought it was a fun film. Well, out of my list of the 94, it's definitely in the 40s. So it's it's a fun slasher. Like, it is a fun, fluffy slasher. So if you just feel like watching something that takes you back to the summertime good times, this bad boy is it. And if you like water parks, and I love me some water parks. Me too. And this movie just totally hits home. So I loved it. I will probably – this is one that I could throw on, like – not to say that it's on par with any of the Friday the 13th films. That's not what I mean when I say this, but it's one of those movies like The Burning or something that you could just throw on and watch yep. and not have to think too hard about it and enjoy the plot because it's just so typical and easy to understand and easy to digest. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, and I just looked and it's my number 44. So it's like pretty much right around nice. where you are. But yeah, nice. it's just one of those fun films that uh, are it's just something fun, uh, fun and easy to watch. Nice. I'm glad that you that you dug it as well. Um, was it? How did you? Oh no, we know how we watched it. We watched it through Good Friends Plex, but I believe it's yep. available for rent. Yep, it's available for rent through Prime. Through Prime, okay. And the next one, I guess this is just me. Cause I don't know. Did you watch this one? No, this one I wasn't. I couldn't remember like if this one was worth checking out or not when you watched it. So I just kind of waited. So the one that I'm referring to is Eerie. And Eerie is a Filipino film that takes place within the Catholic Church um, and within a convent school. Well, it's a school run by nuns, so I shouldn't say it's a convent school. It's a school that is run by nuns, and it's a ghost story. The ghost story is actually not that bad. Um, the the acting is very solid it is long it's 101 minutes long and honestly it did not need to be 101 minutes long <laughs> it probably could have been 90 minutes and that would have been fine and the ending kind of left me a little confused now it did go back and forth between english and i'm not sure what the language is because i thought that people spoke primarily um English in the Philippines, so maybe it's Spanish. I'm not sure what the language is, but it does go back and forth between two different languages, and the subtitles are there, and it's 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 solid. Like I think that if you enjoy foreign films and you really like ghost stories, it's worth a watch. But the ending had me confused um, that I didn't quite get what the outcome was, so that's why it wasn't that high on my list, and I found it a little long. But the the effects of the ghost, the the reaction of the characters in it was pretty solid. Nice. Uh, well, then I'll, I maybe we'll have to give this one a watch then. I well, guess. it'll add to your 2020 list. Right, exactly. And it sounds like it's at least worth watching compared yeah, to like it, some that I'm just avoiding. Yeah, it's no Wakefield project. I assure yeah, you. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the next one, uh, we both watched this one, I believe, right? Demon Eye? Yep. Yep. Yep, it's uh, Demon Eye, which is probably one of the... I think it was like a super low budget horror film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, but, it was. But yeah, it's about a young woman that returns to her father's country house in the moors following his mysterious death and finds a cursed amulet connected to the local witchcraft. And then she unlocked two deadly demons who haunt her. I feel like this movie was made for $50 um, with very, very limited budget. But with that being said, it was pretty damn good. Yeah, um, 
the one thing I like you don't really like the main girl. No, she's not very likable. And you kind of don't really like they kind of allude to why she's not likable, but the reasoning isn't strong enough for me to be how she is. The right. effects are pretty decent for what they do. It's all practical. Yeah. And you know, once again, like we've talked before, like they use their budget wisely and man, they were able to create some really like atmospheric, creepy scenes, like stuff that kind of gave me chills. Yeah. And I think for, you know, for a low budget, for an 87 minute film, it's long enough. I was entertained enough watching it. What I tell people to run out and watch it, I would say if you really enjoy independent films and you want to see one done well, this is probably, a, a, yet again, another very good example. I would put this up with The Perfect Host yeah. in very well done independent films. And, you know, out of some of the other stuff we watched, it's better than a lot of other things. But I would say if you're, if you're choosing what you're going to put your time into, unless you really enjoy, like, possession stories, I guess you could say, this probably wouldn't be a go-to I would say for most people right yeah this one's definitely just uh depends on your tastes but like all in all like because I'm not even a big fan of most exorcism films and Mm. I still like this one Mm. and I mean granted I am finding that like certain genres in horror I never liked before I'm actually starting to appreciate more since I'm doing this first time watches so who knows maybe exorcism films will be something I'll really dig more maybe Maybe there will be. Maybe you'll need to be exercised eventually. I already need to be exercised. <laughs> no, not exercise, Scott. Be exercised. <laughs> oh, 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 gotcha. <laughs> like, oh. right. And that super funny joke, we're going to lead into Ghost Stories from 2020, <laughs> which is a Netflix film. It, pardon me, it's a Hindi film. Now, it's a Hindi film. When I say it's a Hindi film, I mean that it reflects the Hindu culture, but it's actually in English. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, like I was telling you, it was a little bit hard for me to understand the with the heavy heavy accents while I was at work because I had to keep my volume a bit low. But I, you know, I paused it and came home to finish the rest of the movie. And when I got home and I was able to turn it up, like, yeah, I had no problems with the accents. But it's just something you had to get used to. You got to be used to like listening for heavy accents just kind of like if you're watching a like really irish horror film you got to get used to the irish accents and all that stuff you're just not around enough people from different cultures apparently not (laughs) i've been where you live you're not (laughs) no (laughs) but yeah there is definitely some heavy accents and i think for anyone that watches this movie it does very much play on the south asian culture and for example throughout the movie Older people are referred to as uncle and auntie. So when I realized that during the first ghost story, which the ghost stories here are very long. It's almost a two-hour movie. So each story yeah. is 25 minutes. Like, it's a it's a long film. I made sure to let Scott know that uncle and auntie are what, in the South Asian culture, is what you call someone who is an elder. So when I was married um, to my ex who was South Asian, I did take Punjabi classes. And I took them through the school board, but I also used to go to a place called Gudwara, which is their place of worship for individuals that are Sikh. So a little bit different than Hindus, but place of worship for people from the South Asian culture. And I would refer to the elders there as uncle and auntie. Um, okay. Actually, I would say uncle G and auntie G, as, and you add the G as a sign of respect. Oh, okay. So that's why uncle and auntie are used so much in this, because I think a Westerner watching this, not knowing this, because everyone refers to an older person in all the stories as uncle and auntie. They'd yeah. be like, is everyone related to each other? No, that's just a form of respect. Um, actually, in the South Asian culture, a little bit of trivia here. If you are, you're, you're referred to as an aunt and uncle, depending on how the marriage is. So when I was married to my ex-husband, his sister's children would call me Heather Mummy. So mummy was the word for aunt and mamu was the word for uncle. And then they would call my ex-brother-in-law something different because that's an older brother, right? So it's all dependent on siblings, right? And what they're, where, like male to female, et cetera, or whatever. So your names are there, like, unlike the English culture, where it was aunt and uncle, aunt and uncle, and it tends to be very blood related. In the South Asian culture, it's very much just interchangeable. So 
that's a long story there for this movie. But I think that if you do watch this movie, it helps you make sense. The Fuller Gore stories are quite good. Uh, but yeah. very much play into the concept of the evil eye, uh, superstitions, except for the the la- the middle one, which kind of plays more into zombies. That actually yeah. doesn't play anything with the with the South Asian culture. And then the final one looks at um, superstitions and death and arranged marriages, and it's and it's very very well done. And even they're all filmed a little differently. I have really enjoyed them. I, I don't know if this would be something for the masses. I, I feel like mm. you have to really like South Asian films to enjoy this and have some knowledge or know somebody who has some knowledge of the culture to get it. What do you think? Uh, for the most part, yeah, I would have to agree. Um, either that or if you are just someone that just wants to uh, like learn and get more knowledge on different cultures and how they do horror films, this would be a way to check it out as well. Because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this was a very fascinating story. Uh, well, all four of them were very fascinating stories in this. And a couple of them were extremely creepy. Some of them were just kind of just, uh, like, they were okay, but they were still, like, really good. Like, all in all, this was, like, I would consider this an anthology with four the four stories. And well, it's considered a- an anthology, yeah. And, yeah, I'd say this is a pretty damn good anthology all around because there was not one bad story at all. I'm glad you felt that way because I am biased towards South Asian films. I do, you know, I did immerse myself a lot in that culture to the extent that I could living in Ontario, Canada. Um, so I have a, a different understanding of them, not to the same extent that someone's from that culture, by no stance would I say that, but I do have a different level of understanding. That's just a reality. Um, right. So I feel like I get a little bit more enjoyment out of them than other people would. So I'm glad to hear you kind of outline that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because this was a really good just all-around movie and like yeah i'm kind of glad that you're picking these finding these films on netflix and having me check them out because a lot of these films i would have just kind of skipped right over because it wouldn't have been something i would have really thought about looking into i'm glad you're bringing these to the forefront for us because i'm really enjoying what i've been seeing and learning about these cultures well that's why we're up to 94 films right (laughs) right (laughs) <laughs> right we work together to kind of go through and we and we kind of shift them i think of like gold miners when they're out searching for gold and they're in the waters and they're shifting their their trays to kind of get the gold out that's what we're basically doing and that's why we share these 2020 movies right we share right what we think is really good what we think oh you might enjoy this or you know what you'll only enjoy this if blah 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 or don't waste your time and it's kind of like we're doing the hard work for a lot of people so that they can choose to invest their time in something that they really want to watch. Absolutely. And thank God I enjoy doing this because it, it's, I, because this year has not been that bad. Like there's been a couple of years where it's been really bad with the movies I chose, but I've learned, I've learned over the years to avoid certain looking films. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, there's a couple we've like I've avoided. Um, but uh, to be honest with you, I feel like sometimes you got to be careful because there's movies I would have avoided other years that I never would have watched. I never would have watched right. live scream. Ever. Right. And I never would have watched any of these uh, Hindi or Arabic films that we've been watching. Right. So I think that you, I think that you make a good point, but at the same time, um, for me anyway, I don't feel like, I still feel like I'm a novice movie watcher compared to the other people we know in the podcasting community. So mm. I feel the need to expand my taste too. And it's really helped me establish what I look for in a good film. Yeah. Right. And then also understand what other people look for too. Uh, but there is just sometimes a level of enjoyment that comes with something that you can't, and you know, you forgive shortcomings of it because you just like it so much. Right. Yep. I can definitely agree with that. Uh, but yeah, I guess we can move on to the next film. This one, it's Motel Acacia or also Acacia Motel. I've mm-hmm. seen it in both ways, like when you search it up. Yes. But uh, wow, this was one that uh, Mark Nato and Tim Walker had both like really praised. And so we ended up watching this just this past Sunday. And it was really bizarre really really bizarre but it was a very fascinating film it was a uh, a filipino director with filipino actors but it was pretty much a a filipino director's look an outside look at americans and the american country and the canadians and canadian border <laughs> yeah <laughs> like it was their like bird eye perspective on things and it 
it's very fascinating like to see like what's the uh, what we're how we're looked at from other countries and uh it's very lovecraftian like well i don't even, i don't know if i'd call it lovecraftian but it's uh it's steeped in the filipino for folklore mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the i i meant to look into the folklore a little bit more before wick we recorded today but i didn't get a chance to but yeah i I was really, really intrigued and fascinated by this film from beginning to end. Like, I didn't, I had to read a Wikipedia, like, plot synopsis afterwards just to kind of figure out what the heck just happened. But once I did that, like, it made so much sense to me. But it's a very, very bizarre film. Yeah, it it definitely is. And it's like a creature feature mixed with an urban legend, mixed with political commentary. Like it's a very kind of all encompassing film, simple set, uh, great creature design. Yeah, great creature design. Um, And not really sure what's going to happen. And the ending kind of like, I did find the ending a little like, I get it. It's artistic. I get it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and when I found out it was supposed to be the Canadian border, I rolled my eyes pretty hard. But <laughs> I'm going to forgive it and assume that it was out in Manitoba in January. Um, so, you know, I really did enjoy it. But strangely enough, for a film that had me written all over it, I didn't dig it as much as I thought I would. Yeah, and that doesn't I'm... mean that it's a bad movie. I right. just didn't invest in it as much as I thought I would and maybe it's because they were trying to be too much to everything and I just found it overwhelming yeah I mean well like like I was just saying like I've said it multiple times I'm sorry but it's just bizarre like that's the best way I can describe it because it's just such a weird style film but like yeah I, I really liked it I think I had it in my top 20 see I don't think it was bizarre like, I found the plot fairly easy to follow. I found the intentions fairly easy to understand. I just felt like they were trying to be like, okay, there's prejudice in America, check. Okay, urban folklore, check. And they're, okay, creature, cool creature, check. Okay, characters that you hate, check okay, freedom to this place that you really don't know if it's free or not, check. Like, it just seems so, like, it was trying to be every kind of movie that it could possibly be in a, I think, how long was it? An 87-minute runtime? Yeah. That's what I found overwhelming. Now, it could have been in the mood that I was in the day that I watched it, or whatever the case may be, but... It wasn't a bad film. I just thought that they they did too much. I don't feel it was bizarre at all. I think that's where we differ. I don't feel it was bizarre. I just think they did too much. Yeah, I was saying, I, like, I don't feel like they did too much. Like, I felt like they could have done more mm. if they'd given more time to expand it. Interesting. So then we have two very polar opposite opinions on this film. So that's good. Yeah, and I looked it up, and it's my number 11. Yeah, it's up in the 20s for me. I did obviously value it. It's a very, very good movie. Um, well-made, well-acted, entertaining. And it may change as I think about it because sometimes like I'll usually rate things in the moment and then yep. I'll reflect and move things around accordingly. And I've been busy with work, so I haven't been spending a lot of time on my movie list this week. Um, but yeah, so it'll be interesting to see where it falls. Yeah, I I definitely, uh, I, I recommend it. It's It's one that's got to be seen. Yeah, it was worth the money we paid for it. I definitely have no regrets there. Yeah. Uh, and I guess uh, I'll go on to the next film because mm-hmm. I don't think you've seen this one. Nope. All right. So I ended up checking out another one that Mark Nato had recommended called Silhouette from 2020. And this one was also another kind of like low budget hidden gem. Um, but it's about this couple that have lost their daughter due to a tragic accident. And they end up moving into this new house to try to just kind of create a new life but then the mother is pretty much haunted by the ghost of her daughter. Gosh, this sounds like such an interesting new plot that's never been done before. <laughs> Continue, Scott. <laughs> and Sorry. the father is just very uninterested and not really there. And... You don't say. 
Oh, it, it, I do say Heather. I do. Are they, are, and then is there some paranormal investigators that show up to one haunted house? <laughs> and it's actually no. haunted. I'm sorry, Scott. I'm cutting you off. Continue the story of Silhouette. I love how you do this to me every time it's a movie I've only watched you. <laughs> I know. But I'm only doing it because the plot sounds so basic, bitch. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, it pretty much is. And it does, like, it goes in a place where it's very predictable. Mm. But, like, it's very effective with the way it's done, especially for its budget. Mm. And the acting is really, especially the acting is really, really good between the couple. Like, really freaking good. And that seems to be something I've noticed about myself lately is uh, couples and, like, relationship issues definitely seem to be a thing this year that I am, like, really focused on. I just picture you with a bowl of popcorn and an oversized pop drinking me like, preach it, brother! (laughs) (laughs) like he's watching it and like you ordered like a large cheese pizza to yourself as well it's like like, yeah (laughs) stuffing the food in your face to make the pain stop um (laughs) but uh i think it's well acted is it like an after midnight kind of level of acting kind of dialogue thing um to an extent like it's not like dialogue heavy but like like the scenes where there is like interactions between the couples it's just the performances between the two. You can really like believe what they are, how they are acting. Um, though I will give you warning. I think I did warn you while I was messaging you going, uh Oh, feels like it's going down that theme that you absolutely cannot stand. Oh, oh and it, and it, it does. But it can be done well. Yeah. I was saying for the most part, I thought this was done well. I still have an issue with that third act. But all in all, it's still worth checking out. It's free on Prime. Um, I'll say I'm not sure if it's available in Canada, but hopefully it is. Uh, so I guess, yeah, we can talk about the last 2020 oh, film. Oh, sure, sure should. This movie right here, man, <laughs> Outback 2020. What a survivalist mm. film. Uh. Um, let's see here. It's based on a true story, which I, oh, sorry, inspired by true events, which I tried to research the true events. Couldn't really find a, a clear answer. Um, yeah, it was so dumb. I don't even know what to say about this movie. It was just so fucking stupid. Like, it was just... It was it was two people who planned so poorly for a 76-hour car ride that I was going to the beach with my friends. Two days later, it was an hour away, and we had more snacks and water than these people had on their 76-hour trip to the Outback. Right. And I feel like that just sums up the stupidity of this film. <laughs> well, and they're, they're a couple that is pretty much, like, at wit's ends with each other, and they take this vacation to kind well, of rekindle the love. And, like, this dude proposes to her on the plane. She says no. You caught yeah. that, right? Yeah. And then they have to go on this trip together. Yeah. Like, can you imagine proposing? Like, first of all, this conversation you should have, like, before you get on the fucking plane. Right. Right? Like, there should be some, like, you should be sure that the person's going to be like, yay, let's do this. And then you ask in front of a group of people, and she says no, and then you're going to fucking travel together? Like, oh, my God, I can't even, I can't yeah, that- even imagine. And they're constantly at each other's throats and nitpicking each other. And this is the, like, if we were still doing our survival horror episode, we would have probably put this in the, uh, in our topic just to say, and this is what you don't do because these people did everything wrong. So he goes in the ocean. Okay. Like this is a spoiler. Spoiler to the amusing, amazing movie that is Outback. So he goes in the ocean. This is in the first 20 minutes. They stop at some random beach in Australia because that's a good idea. So they go in the ocean, and he gets stung by a jellyfish. Surprise, surprise. I had been stung by a jellyfish. I was in Mexico with my ex-husband, and I went in the water when I wasn't supposed to because I'm a dumbass. And I put my hand in, and I was only up to my knee, and I got stung by a jellyfish. It was cloudy. It was dark. I couldn't see, and it stung me. The pain that you feel is pretty intense let me tell you oh i believe it now it's not like oh my god you feel like your arm's gonna fall off so i came out and i looked down i'm like holy fuck i must have been stung by a jellyfish because i'm a bright individual and i put together that that's i didn't get picked by a shark so i was able to put together what happened so i went to the resort doctor 
who was like, well, you're not allergic, blah, 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 and then gave me a needle in my bum <laughs> to bring down the reaction. And I felt better. Like within an hour or two, my swelling of my, my hand and my arm had come down. I was fine. Like this dude walked around with a fucking jelly, jellyfish bite sting, whatever. And like, it was like, like he was like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't need to go get medical treatment for this. Like what the hell is wrong with this guy? Like well, I've never then, seen more stupid. And then he was like telling his uh, girlfriend, like, how oh, do you got to pee on it? Cause it, like, it'll take away the sting and everything. And she's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. That's actually not a thing by the way. Too. I, I know. Just so you're clear, if you ever get stung by a jellyfish, don't let anyone tell you that they should do that. But, no. <laughs> um, and then like the series of other stupid events that they get engaged in, like, oh, oh they make such dumb decisions left and right. Like the one thing I will give this film is the acting, especially from the guy, mm-hmm. like really good. Yes, the acting was solid. The acting was very good. I will agree with you, and the filming was good. But the yeah. plot was stupid. Oh, the plot was stupid. The characters were idiots. They were idiots. And you know what's funny? We have two good friends, um, Horror for Dummies, Tim and Daniel. And I asked them once if they ever go to the Outback. And they're like, no. Why would we do that? <laughs> you know? Like, that is such, like, right. like, a touristy, stupid touristy thing to do. And anyway, yeah, don't don't watch this movie. It's just going to hurt your brain. And you're just going to be annoyed at the dumb things that they do. And unless you, I don't know, really want to see a lot of desert. (laughs) It's and watch someone get stung by a jellyfish and be an idiot. Then yeah, that's a great film or, you know, have lots of tensions between two people who can't communicate whether they want to get married or not. Then yeah, it's great. But if if none of that floats your boat, skip this. (laughs) Yeah. Like unless you just want to see like how to do everything wrong. Yeah, if you want to be like, oh man, feel better about yourself because you're like, I wouldn't end up in that shit. <laughs> right. Like you and I, when we were messaging each other, we're just going, wow, yeah, that's not what you would do. No, no, that's not at all what you did. We'd survive this longer than these fuckers. <laughs> well, we wouldn't even be there. You know where we would be? Sydney, getting some fucking drinks with Tim and right? Randall. That's what we would be <laughs> Fuck that shit. I'd be like, where do you guys think I should go? And I will go there. I wouldn't be like, gonna peace off to the outback and hope for the best. Like, right. Screw oh that. My goodness, right? Anyway, that's our end of our 2020. <laughs> We've been yeah. watching. So we talked. We we went on a high note there. We went on a real high note there. But there's been a lot of really good films that we've seen. And if you have not had a chance to check out um, the film, do more than welcome to follow Scott or I on Letterbox, and we post all our 2020 watches there. And um, yeah, we'll give you you know tell us what your tastes are, and we can tell you what we think you would like. And yeah. uh, we're happy to do that because 2020 has not been a horrible year for films. So no, we're and here to support our horror brothers and sisters. And if there's something that you uh, haven't heard us talk about, like in these top 20 or in these 2020 films, like something maybe we missed, feel free to suggest it because we're always up for suggestions and checking out other films. Unless it's a cult film, then just or Lovecraft, and just suggest it to Scott. Yep, and I'll and I'll suggest it to Heather without letting her know. Yeah. Yeah. And then she'll get pissed off at me. <laughs> <laughs> because we have such a good friendship. Yes. So I guess we're going to go back to our older movies now. Um, mine are first. <laughs> La-di-da. I get to keep talking. And I've got to see both of them, though. Oh, um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> the last couple of days, I've been on this uh, 1980 slasher kick, mostly because of our main topic, which I didn't even introduce. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we'll get to it it's uh, a surprise guys just you wait and see if you haven't no. read the, if you haven't read the thumbnail <laughs> surprise. um but yeah girls night out 1982 what a fun slasher yeah i was really like i did not know what to expect out of this and this was like this is like so my jam i had so much fun with this yeah you love girls nights out and you I love do. slashers I'm, yes I'm, I'm all about girl nights out because I'm, I'm one of the girls right um it was i've heard i heard it on the exploding heads top 50 slasher and i was like i eventually gotta watch that because i had never really heard of it before and yeah like man it was fun like fun kills the characters are very likable that are in it um the killer at the end you're kind of like what's going on with the killer like it's it's an interesting concept um but yeah i totally if you dig 80 slashers and for some reason you've missed this one check it out yeah, because this is one that just completely went under my radar. Like, and I, and I and I thought I was a big fan of like 
slasher films, especially from the 80s, but a couple of these I had never seen before, and I'm like, why did I miss them? Well, you also think in your horror movies, but... <sighs> Ouch. As each day goes, we begin to... <laughs> It's proved that more and more. Sorry, Scott. I just started watching movies this year. Don't take me too seriously. That's it. I quit. <laughs> um, the next one was a suggestion from Mr. Brandon Orlick from the Exploding Heads podcast and the future life partner of myself and Scott. Yes. Um, oh, the love we're going to have. <laughs> yeah, you're the needy one in the relationship, so I hope Brandon knows what he's getting involved in. I'll just attach myself to him wherever he goes. You will. You have no idea. You're like a big cuddly bear. Um, <laughs> anyway, so visiting hours, 1982. Wow. Like, I, this has shot up to one of my top slashers. I just, I love the main girl in it, the main woman. Reminds me of me. Okay. Did you not think that was similar to me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I absolutely did, actually. And I'm like, yeah, bitch. <laughs> That's how you get shit done. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Based uh, and Michael Ironside's in it. Yes. Oh, my God. That was awesome to see him in this film. Oh, he's such a good actor. He is. Um, William Shatner's in it. William Shatner's in it. Like, it's such a good movie. And it's basically based on a news reporter who is advocating for women's rights and a dude who is not cool with it. You find out very early on who all the players are. Yeah. Like, there's no guessing. But man, is it good. Man, yeah, is like, it- it's just, it's great at building tension. It's mm-hmm. great at like building the characters up. Like even like the ancillary characters, like you feel for them. Like the girl that uh, Michael Ironside meets at the bar. Oh, yeah, you're, like, dreading her going back home with him. Yeah. Like, you're like, girl, no, no. Mm-mm. It's a Homie bad idea. It, right? <laughs> but, yeah, this was freaking solid-ass slasher film. Yeah, it was like, really good. Really, really good. I really enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I had I had a lot of fun with this one. If I had to do a top ten list, it would probably be right at the top of my top ten or, like, just right outside of it. I'm not sure yet. I would have to, like, actually see it. It'd be pretty high, high on mine. It'd probably be number five. Yeah, just I know it'd be because like, like a... me and that character, I'm like, I see you. <laughs> I am you. Yeah, yeah, that I is totally you. Heather from yeah. the 80s. <laughs> I would, that's me now. What are you talking about? I'm just well, as equally mad. <laughs> well, I know, but I'm just saying, but no, like in the 80s, like that 80s style. Oh man, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, I loved her. And that opening scene with the with the lawyer and she's just giving him the gears. Oh, oh my sh- god. Yeah, that was great. She was my hero. <laughs> I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get enough anyway. So yeah, I loved it. Loved it. Great film. Um, there's a couple more I checked out as well. I just didn't want to go over them. Maybe we'll, when we do an 80 slasher, we'll talk more about them, but yeah, man, good, good, good times. Yeah. Th- these were very fun films done. Yeah. I'm glad that uh, you suggested those as well. And I'm glad Brandon suggested them to you. I know. Well, I have good taste. You do. You do. Right. <laughs> I'm starting to learn that. No. It's true. <laughs> uh, and speaking of not so good taste though, I'm going to tell you about one of the movies I chose to watch. Harvest. <laughs> Sorry, I almost read it. <laughs> I just can't yep. get around the title. Is. It was enjoyable, but it's called Harvest Lake 2016. And it kind of goes with the theme of our episode. Uh, it's a Cabin in the Woods style horror film about these uh, one couple and a her friend and their gay friend all ride together. And they go to this cabin and apparently there is a creature in the water that pretty much makes you lose all inhibitions and all you want to do is sexy times. Are you sure this was a horror movie, Scott? It was, I was wondering at one point. I was really wondering. (laughs) At what server or website did you find this movie, Scott? This one was actually on Tubi. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. And was looked... everybody like super hot in it? Yeah. Yeah, they were all like banging bodies, right? Yep, exactly. Okay. <laughs> and but this will tell you this will be where the point where I started questioning what the hell I was watching. And then you cause... went and got the hit the skin lotion, but yes. Yes. Well, I didn't even need the lotion at that point. I was already lubed up. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, magical times. Magical. They times. end up going to the beach on uh of this lake and <laughs> While they're at the beach, like, all of a sudden, like, the sexy time feels uh, happen, <laughs> and they go wandering off, like, almost like in a daze into the woods, 
and uh, one of the girls finds this mushroom that is slowly getting erect and oozing white stuff out of the tip of it, and she leans down and is about to lick it. Another guy finds a mushroom on a log that looks like a clitoris that is dripping juices, and he's getting down to get ready to lick oh it. Oh my god, Scott, you watched a porn. This isn't and even well, a horror movie. Well, it never got any further than that, because they both start to do that, and then like they snap out of their trance and like, what the hell are we doing? And But, oh my god, this movie. This movie. <laughs> it's so freaking weird. I... <sighs> Make sure you include the link in the notes for people that want to watch it. Oh, gosh, I don't even know if I want to because this is. Well, there might be somebody that wants to. That's true. I mean, I will say there isn't much nudity. Oh. For it's just very sexual in nature with everything in this film. Very bizarre. Very low budget, and very suggestive with its themes. Obviously, if it I'm telling you about <laughs> completely ridiculous, like it wants to be a porn. Oh, it's it's it's, it's like a porn parody minus uh, minus the actual pornography. <laughs> That sounds so dumb, but oh, it was. Bless your heart, Scott. I tried it just because it's something I've never seen before, and I'm like, all right. Oh, well, what did I get myself well, into? Well, just so you know, everybody, Scott's willing to do things he's never seen or done before. So, hey, I mean, you're you're living your best life when you're. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, sounds great. So, what was the next one you watched, Scott? Oh, uh, the next one I watched is uh, definitely a lot less sexual. <laughs> that Aww. one is. Uh, that one is Joyride from 2001, uh, which stars Paul Walker, and I forget the other guy's name, but he's in like Saturday Night Live and stuff like that, but they are a story about two brothers who are end, in, end up going on a long road trip, and the one brother finds out they have a CB radio in their car. So, like a typical teenager, even though they're not. Even though they, like, are old. Yeah. <laughs> but like they're we'll earlier. But they decide to start pranking truckers with a CB radio, which is something I would have done at the age of fucking 15. Translation last week. Yes, continue. Yeah. But, oh, you smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, and they end up uh, pr- pulling a prank on this one trucker, and I think was uh, pretending to be a girl named Candy. Was that what it was? Candy Cane. Candy Cane. Oh, and, candy cane. <laughs> and they end up, like, convincing him to go to a motel and to someone's door that's not really there. And, with pink champagne? Yep, with pink champagne. Wow, you remember this movie pretty damn well. <laughs> I remember being like, like, I don't know, like, I think truckers are kind of hot. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> like, not the not the scary looking ones. Well, maybe a little scary looking. Um, You know. But, um, yeah, I just remember thinking, like, pink champagne. Who the fuck drinks that shit? Right. <laughs> I'd be like, bring the white claw. <laughs> bring the white claw and the Moscato. <laughs> anyway. But, uh, yeah, this was a first-time watch for me. And, like, it goes pretty much just becomes this long, drawn-out, like, road chase horror film. And I actually enjoyed it. It was uh, pretty entertaining. And it's definitely, definitely a product of its time of 2001 <laughs> it was 2001 all right yeah oh my gosh <laughs> but yeah all in all i thought this was still a pretty enjoyable film i like it for the candy cane i think paul walker's great in it rest paul Hart. press rest in peace paul walker um yeah. i think the characters are all really likable it had like some of the hottest 2001 stars i can't remember their names but i see their faces um it wasn't my movie so i don't feel like i should have been the one to look it up um yeah, right but it's it's a really good I think it's a great film. I think it's really enjoyable. I've seen the sequel. I actually like Join Ride 2. I did think that one was kind of cool as well, but I didn't see them after that. But I do like the uh the concept of the trucker and you know, like these guys were kind of a dick, but he does take it a little far too. Um Yeah. But yeah, like the scene in the cornfield where he's chasing them and it's good. It's a really good movie. It's very suspenseful. Yeah, I'll say it builds up a lot of tension. Yeah. And I looked up some of the other actors' names. Steve Zahn, that's the other guy yep. I was trying to think of that I think was in Saturday Night Live. Um, then Lily Sobieski, which I also recognize her, but I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, she was pretty big in the 2000s. Yeah. She was in a lot of stuff. So, yeah, good times. I'm glad you enjoyed that one. Glad yeah. you finally got around to watching it and acting like you were a teenager in the late 2000s. I'm or early 2000s, sorry. Well, I wasn't a teenager in the early 2000s. At that. Well, I guess I would have been until 2002. Yeah, you were a teenager. 
<laughs> you were a teenager. Uh, yeah, because he's 21. Drinking age is 21 in the States. You were a bibby. I'm just yeah, a bibby. Was. Bibby Scott. Bibby. <laughs> yeah, I say not lucky enough to uh, be drinking at the age of, what was it, 19? Legally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll say that that's when I probably started drinking oh, legally. Oh, you child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. Um anyway. <laughs> you know, I've always been a good time, Scott. Let's just make that clear. I I will. Um yeah. So anyway, podcast. What we've been listening to is our next segment that we're going to move into. And as um I don't, I'm pretty sure this is public knowledge because it's been announced on many a podcast at this point. Uh, a very well-known network called Horophilia will be uh, closing down as of February 2021. And we have a lot of friends whose podcasts are on there. And previously, we wanted to try to promote independent podcasts outside of Horophilia and Legion, with the exception of some, just because we wanted to give other people the limelight. But with Horophilia closing down its doors. I uh, I will be highlighting podcasts from Horophilia moving forward because I think it's important that we put them out in the spotlight there, that we they get some listeners behind them, especially depending on what their next steps will be. Right. So a podcast that we have been on, Scott and I as guests, and actually a podcaster that's very near and dear to my heart and one of my first true friends in the podcasting community outside of the dudes from Kill the Cast and, and Venom is Derek B. And he runs, he runs several podcasts, but one of them is called Cinema Attacks. And it's a podcast that attacks all forms of cinema with no, expect- no exceptions, from horror to science fiction, from comedy to drama. There's no stone, stone left unturned. And he works with two gentlemen. I can't remember their names right now, which is horrible because we were on a show with them. Uh, but Derek is kind of the, the runner of the show. So I do want to give him the props here. I believe he chooses the movies and he does all the editing and I think he does all the editing. I could be wrong yeah, on that. I think he does on that. Um, and it's a really good analytical dive into different films. Derek is somebody who knows everything about all the films that could be out there. If you have a question about an actor or you're wondering about a director or you need a film to fit a certain subgenre, Derek knows. He is just so knowledgeable and one of the nicest and sweetest and kindest people I've ever met. I have nothing but respect for him as a person and also as a podcaster. He He's a very chill ex, chill ex calm guy. And if you're listening to... If you want a podcast that's going to up your knowledge on film, listen to Cinema Attacks. Currently, you can find it on the Horophilia Network, but I'm sure that he will be spreading his wings into um, other avenues as well, but definitely check him out. Yeah, their show is really awesome, and I freaking love Derek. He is such a great guy. He really is. He's a, he's a true gem. Oh, he definitely is. And yeah, he is like an encyclopedia of film knowledge it's crazy (laughs) it's true it's true uh so yeah i guess i will jump into the podcast i will talk about and that is trick or treat radio uh these guys have been around for i i think it's going on six years now they're a weekly podcast they actually do a video live stream of their show on wednesdays so like if you jump on their live stream you can just watch them as a recording and um then on Fridays, they release the audio version onto pretty much every podcast catcher out there. But it is Trick or Treat Radio is the world's most dangerous podcast. They discuss at least one film a week, argue, make fun of each other, and hope to make you laugh. Some hosts might even die trying. The hosts are Johnny Wolfenstein, Monster Zero, Ares the God of War, and Michael Ravenshadow, which has probably 20 more names after that whenever Johnny inter- introduces him. Like That's the, cool. Like the chain, what is it, uh, the chain smoker for Castle Wolfenstein and <laughs> uh, the Razapan loving comic book reading nerd. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, these guys are just really good. They, they usually review one movie. It's either VOD or some type of streaming. Occasionally we'll cover like a uh, blockbuster type horror film. But their mainly f- main focus is on horror films, independent stuff, exploitation. Um, And they'll usually go on for about an hour and a half before they even get to the movie, just talking about some random topic. They could be talking about, like, uh, 
the newest episode of AEW or WWE and just like talking about like everything that happened there or they could uh, be talking about toys from the 80s and Transformers and just man these gentlemen sound awesome are they single <laughs> I have no idea. Oh man, I like the way they roll. They sound like right up my alley. I'll say like they are like they are the exact same like they're like us. Like they like yeah, the same type it. of stuff as us. It is. Well, they you are... said Transformers and AEW, and I was all like, "What?" Yeah. Well, they even do uh, like whenever a pay per view for either WWE or AEW, they will do a collaboration with outside the cinema. The guys I brought up a couple episodes ago, and they'll do like this big extravaganza about the. Uh, about that wrestling pay-per-view that's awesome really cool 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 yeah cool. the great guys highly recommend checking them out and i believe they actually used to give uh, exploding heads a shout out back in the day which is kind of funny no look at that oh, everyone so, knows each other i'll say it just kind of goes around full circle it really does and we just joined the circle yep circle of podcast. circle jerk <laughs> i went with the circle of podcasting and <laughs> you went with circle jerk oh, well, that's who uh, I well you did watch harvest lake so you're all revved up from that movie <laughs> right. mm. <laughs> so we will be moving into our main topic but we will take a short break and we will see you shortly hello hello who is this who are you trying to reach I think you've got the wrong number. Do I? I'm going to hang up. Wait, don't hang up. What's that noise? Popcorn? You're making popcorn. Uh-huh. I only eat popcorn when I listen to podcasts. I'm about to listen to a podcast. Oh, really? Which one? Probably the podcast on Haunted Hill. Is that the one with the two guys with the beards? Uh, yeah, Dan and Gav. Most episodes, they look at two different horror movies. Each episode, they look at a world of a strange, where they look at weird things from around the world. Sometimes, they even do special episodes where they look at different genres or directors' discographies and talk about them. Do you have a boyfriend? Maybe. So where can I find the podcast on Haunted Hill? Well, you can go to legionpodcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, or just go into iTunes and search for the podcast on Haunted Hill. So, are you going to ask me out? And welcome back to our main topic. So we are going to be looking at cabins and campgrounds and horror. So as most of us know, we are in the summer season and we are getting ready to go out to summer camps if they're still running in your area or cabin or camping, whatever activities you choose to engage in. And these have been ingrained into our movie subculture. So we will be talking about certain movies that have captured the experience of summer camp, but in a very dark fashion. But first, let's figure out the history of summer camps. And we'll start off with the United States. So for children and adolescents, summer camp has been a fixture of American life. So this is coming from an article that we found in Daily History. What is the history of summer camps in the United States? In the summer months, parents have often placed their children in summer camps to avoid boredom or even to keep them out of trouble. Summer camps can be educational, but can also be fun for those involved, helping to get through the summer months. And for adults, it provided a form of child care. So if we're looking at when comes the first, I guess you could say, documented case of summer camps was in the 1870s. So it was seen as a way for boys to heal from the potential negative effects of the city. So we got to look at the Industrial Revolution at that time and the cities being a place where boys would go and work. Yes, schooling was important for those that were a privilege. Those who were in the working class would work and help develop their character. So boys would get exposed to activities such as swimming, rowing, even shooting, hunting with camps, and also teaching them leadership skills. So this would have been reserved for the elite coming from the city um, to engage in these type of activities. By the end of the 19th century, there were over 100 different summer camps. However, within the decade of the 20th century, the number expanded to over 1,000. By 1910, Alan S. Williams founded the American Camp Association, which began to certify standards for camps and include having regiment activities, health standards, and requirements for having a good camp experience. So we went all the way from the 1870s with, within 40 years to creating this whole kind of system of an association to control the experiences and have some kind of standardization of summer camps. So by the time 
World War I rolled around, families believed that girls also need to go to summer camps, but for a different reason. Girls' summer camps were catered to what they believed would be important habits, habits or activities for girls to develop. So mainly home life skills. So we saw this in high schools as well during this time. So sewing, preparing for motherhood. Families by the 1920s began to fear that the so-called flapper culture, so the crazy dancing that ladies were getting into and sneak it in to get that moonshine booze and increasing sexual activity outside of wedlock. Uh -oh. um, exactly. We're going to take away from the mothering and the wife duty that a woman was meant to develop towards. So that was also the development of summer camps. So looking at Ontario, Canada, we do have an Ontario Camp Association, but our summer camps started a little bit later. So we may have had seven summer camps in the 1800s, and I'm sure if we went back to talk about cubs and scouts and stuff like that, that would be a different story. I chose to just focus on camps and move away from scouts only because I wanted to look at the complete summer camp involvement, and scouts is something that goes all year round. So although there were very few children's camps in the 1930s in Ontario, a small group of camp visionaries took it upon themselves to meet regularly, discuss issues of common concerns, such as the importance of offering a well-balanced program, providing a good diet, properly maintaining facilities and equipment, and developing appreciation for the environment and building character. Building character seems to be a really big thing about summer camps, which we all know these horror summer camps have done really well. Oh, yes. yes Absolutely, they have. right? So in Ontario, the camping, the camps were really trained by the YMCA, or it's not trained by, were developed by the YMCA and the YWCA, as well as the Canadian Girls in Training, which was another association. And together, they created the Ontario Camping Association. So the interesting thing about summer camps is that they began to diversify as we begin to look into later generations. So Native Americans or Indigenous and ethnic minorities began to establish summer camps as a way to escape the Americanization of their culture and help go back to their own social identity. So you would start to see camps that are geared towards specific ethnic groups to help them practice um, specific traditions. So for example, Hungarian camp would be a camp where kids could go and learn the Hungarian language, cook Hungarian food, do un Hungarian related sports, for example. Now, if we look at camps today, we have everything from engineering camp to reptile camp um, to student to computer science and development camp. So we have tons of areas where camp has developed to kind of reflect what society's needs are at the time. We actually have specific camps in this area, STEM camps for young ladies to encourage them to go into science and technology in the medical field. So there's lots of avenues that the summer camp trend has gone by but it really began to pick up this overnight staying and going away and all these skills in the 80s and 70s so why is this so important scott what did we see happen in the 1980s well we've seen the boom of the slasher genre we sure did and we started to see the slasher genre of course responding to society so camps were seen as this holistic get back to nature build character they should be properly maintained the children should be well cared for that's why we had these associations so of course what does horror do they want to look at what happens when shit goes bad <laughs> yep <laughs> sure and that, that is not founded so we're going to talk about the burning 1981, which I have to say is probably one of my favorite camp films. Now, when we say camps here, we're talking about active camps. So we will not be talking about Friday the 13th, the original. The reason why is because there's no children at the camp when that movie occurs. Yeah. So we're only going to be reflecting in this episode on camp movies where the children are present engaging in camp-like activities. Now, Scott, I believe you've seen The Burning once or twice. Yeah, just, just a couple times. So I have some notes here about what happens in The Burning, but what do you like about The Burning? How do you think The Burning kind of captures this summer camp phrase and turns things on its head? Well, I would say that the one thing I love about The Burning um, is the building of characters in this, because you get a great cast of characters that are all like, campers themselves they're like older like because the camps i was used to i was really young 
and so was everybody else around me like probably not even in my teens so this is like you know the older teenager style going out and camping and having fun and yeah they spend a lot of time building character like with character development with these people and it feels kind of like an 80s sex comedy for like a good 65 percent of the film well, the opening of it when they're playing, I think it's softball or baseball, and they're making all the sexual jokes and talking about yeah. the girl with that ass. And I remember I listened to, I forget who it was. I think it was when they did the burning versus um, one of the Fridays. Maybe it was Friday too. They did a versus, or no, it was the burning versus something else. I can't remember what they did for the horror call scene. Oh, oh, talked yeah. about how the girl's ass didn't look that good. And like, I watched it again. I'm like, yeah, like her ass is kind of flat. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's, it's very much sexualized right in the opening. Well, once you get past the prank scene, when you get into like the T-ball scene or the baseball scene, it's very sexualized. Yep. Very sexualized. And the characters all act like horny teenagers, like they would like at that age. Especially and, Jason Alexander. Oh my gosh. And he cracks me up in this too. Oh, he's man. like, he is such a goofball in this film. He's great. He, he's really likable in this film and he's funny. Yeah. Like, I think he's funny. I think his character is really clever. I think what's really good about this is they captured how a day in the life would look like, how the showers are outside. And, yeah. you know, you kind of have to schedule who would do a shower. Because when I went away to summer camp, you only had certain days that you could shower. You actually couldn't shower every day. Yep. So, same here. Right, like so, I think that they really captured that well, or the the dining hall and everyone eating, eating in the dining dining hall, and even the bullying and, you know, the cliques that are developed. I feel like this movie did a really good job of en 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 encompassing what summer camp was supposed to be with all these, you know development activities and the social connection and then throwing in this crazy caretaker who is coming back for revenge. Yeah, because they did a really good job with all of that, especially the camp theme. And when they go out and they canoe to the middle of nowhere, I, because that's really where all the action is, right? Is when they go out and they canoe and that's when shit really starts to yep. go down. Um, have you ever had to go on a canoe trip? Was that even the thing that you've done? Oh, yeah. I've done that multiple times, especially when, like, especially, like, I think I learned how to canoe when I went camping. Yeah, I went canoeing, too, when I went away to this overnight camp for a week and I remember I got out of the canoe and I said where are the bathrooms and they said all around you and that was like a traumatic experience for me because <laughs> I really didn't want to do anything in the woods and I got the worst sleep in the world that night like oh my god it was horrible I still remember it like the burning only like nothing serious happened right. um, obviously I'm still here but yeah it was crappy i did not enjoy that time at all so i do love how they go out and they pitch tents and shit and then shit goes down yeah yeah I, uh that it definitely gives you that feel because like yeah i was at a camp for an entire week as well like camp copenaconic actually i remember the name and uh yeah we would do stuff like that like the canoeing and we'd go and like make a tent and it'd just be us young kids like hanging out with like the camp counselor overnight and like, yeah, it was just a very weird experience when you're that age, like, you're not used to being out in nature that much, but it's also very uh, enlightening. I went to the camp that across the lake is where Porky's was filmed. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I found out that when I was, like, 13 there, and of course I hadn't seen Porky's, which is surprising. You would think someone like me would have watched Porky's. Um, but yeah, I, and it was only when I got older and I watched Porky's where I was like, oh, right <laughs> no i get it <laughs> right um but yeah that raft scene i always like i really like that raft scene i know it gets a lot of heat like some people like it some people don't some people think it's cheesy but i like when when they're coming up and you're like oh my god shit's gonna happen shit's gonna happen don't go near it like you kind of feel some anxiety and then like the kills i don't yeah. know i like it i don't what are oh. your thoughts Oh, I absolutely love it, and I am so thankful that we uh, got the uncut version of it, because for a while there, it was edited to, edited to hell, because it was considered, uh, or it was on the chopping block to be considered a video nasty because of that scene. Mm. So it was highly, highly edited until, I think, I think until the DVD came out, and then after the DVD came out, you got to see the unedited version and see all the aftermath and glo gory glory. Yeah, it was for 1981. It was pretty good. And I believe, did Tom Savini work on this one? Yes, yep. he did, right? Um, 
Yeah, like I feel like this movie really did a good job of capturing that, uh, you know, like when Sally and Glazier go out to have sex in the oh, in Glazier. that awkwardness, <laughs> right? And he finishes early, and then she says, "I love how like these chicks in these films though always act like they don't want sex." Yeah, and you know, without getting too crude here, as a healthy functioning thirty-seven-year-old female, I love me sex, and I liked me sex then. Like I've enjoyed sex for a very long time, and I these these chicks that always present as like not liking sex. I don't know if those. I guess they exist, but like that's not me. Like if I was Glazier's girl, I'd be like, yeah, man, let's go. Like, what are we waiting right. for? It would have already happened before we went out to that rock. Let me tell you that much. Um, <laughs> you know, so like I just I always find that an interesting play because I'm like, man, why do these girls always act like it's the worst thing in the world to have like a cock near them? Like I don't. <laughs> I think it's I think it's them playing hard to get. Yeah, but like I, you know, and I and I get it. It's 1981. And I understand all that, but I, and I get the fun part of it, right? Because then it's the chase, and it kind of builds up. And it was actually the expectation at that time is women, you know, and still are supposed to like keep their legs closed, but yet the guys are supposed to get some. Like it's such a right for heterosexual relationships, of course. Um, you know, it's such a fucking like it doesn't make any sense. But anyway, no, <laughs> I really do think that it captured that well in that young love and having crushes and stuff like that. Like I really felt like this movie took summer camp and was like, here you go. And yeah. and really captured in all the things that were wholesome about summer camp, and then like showed the dark side of it and how it can be destroyed by some crazy guys with clippers. You know, <laughs> yeah. I I thought that that was such an awesome concept. Yeah, it's a very good concept, and like obviously one that has been copied many, many, many times. Absolutely right. So we'll move into our next one, Mad Man, originally titled Mad, Mad Man: The Legend, nineteen eighty two. Now I always say man, 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 yeah, right. Like, and that's not the title, but I sing the song. Yeah, the song is so catchy. Right. So this one starts off right away with you know gathering a campfire. The counselors are telling the legend of Madman Marv, Mars, and how he murdered his wife and his children with an axe. Like it sounds like very much like when you would go camping, it would be a campfire story. I remember when I would go to a day camp, we believed that there was a hermit who lived in the (laughs) woods. And we found his lair one day, but he wasn't there, Scott. We were just lucky. Oh, very lucky. Mm-hmm. Who knows what could have happened to poor, sweet, innocent Heather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, I, I don't know. I like this one because it starts right off with that campfire. And it's kind of all based in one night. Yeah. Right? Like, um, it, it, it's, it is one night. Yeah I, th- yeah, I believe it is one night. And, like, yeah, I love when, because I think it was the burning Friday the 13th part two and Madman all did this where it starts off with this camp campfire legend, like yes. in telling the legendary story of like a ur- or an urban legend or a campfire mm-hmm. tale. Mm-hmm. I just like how the characters in here are so annoying. You know, like you have yeah. this cocky asshole that goes and throws rocks at the home and just like causes problems the entire time. I found that really like true to character. Like, I don't know, the characters in here were probably a little over the top, but I felt like they were so accurate to how people would actually behave. I don't know. What do you think? I'd say for the most part, yeah. Um, though, <laughs> I, I, I always got to bring this up whenever I talk about this movie, but it just, uh, I forget the character's name, but the main girl from dawn of the dead she's one of the characters in this and there's that like sexy time hot tub scene and they play like ring around the rosy where they're chasing each other around in circles for like a good five minutes before they even like start (laughs) fooled around i'm like what the hell is this so 80s it's so like it's so this like hard to get i want to have sex but i don't really want to yes let's play this game getting to it and then the kids are really kind of a side story in this like even Mm -hmm. though they're there you know, and they're supposed to be taking care of these sleeping kids. We're basically watching the drama of the camp counselors. Yeah, like pretty much like what the camp counselors do after the kids are all put away and tucked to bed. Which I think what camp counselors would actually do is probably go to bed. Yeah, I'd say there's probably a couple that I could see that would just like stay up and party a little bit, like after the kids go to bed, but like not go crazy wild. No, and then, like, the one, well, I can tell you the camps that I went to, they didn't, because I think they would have got fired in the two, in the 90s, but I feel like in the 80s, maybe, like, probably in the 80s and 70s, there was a little bit more of that, but as time goes on, and especially now, like, yeah, so many 
legalities that you have to think about when running the summer camp, you know, and then we got COVID-19 on top of that and the stress of trying to run a summer camp now too, right? Like it's intense. Yeah. Um, it's probably not even happening here actually. But what I really liked about this movie is, you know, okay, so they, you know, get onto the bus and they're taking off and they, and they get the kids on there and then they run into um, Richie and he's the only one that's escaped and he's been, and he's walking back and he's like shocked and he, I forget what his line is. Oh, he says that Madman Mars is real. Remember that scene at the end? Yes. Yes, I do, actually. Right? And it, that's how it ends. And I remember thinking, what a powerful ending scene. Yeah. Like, because this one was not a big favorite of mine. But, like, mm. yeah, there are certain scenes in this that, like, stick with you. And that is definitely one of those scenes. And I feel like it was just, this one really captured the counselor side of it with the kids being there. I feel yeah. like the burning really did capture the whole camp experience better. And the next film we talk about that we're going to talk about, I feel like did that really well as well too. And I kind of put them in a similar category of doing that well. This to me was like the counselor experience, but the kids are here. Yeah. But the kids are actually there as opposed to, you know, Friday two or one where you're just getting the, the camp counselor experience, but the kids aren't there. Yep. And it's kind of funny because, like, this will tell you how important the children seem to be to the story. Like, I forgot the kids were even in the story. Yeah. Like, they're just, they're there, but they're not a factor in it. But right. then we get to Sleepaway Camp, 1983. Oh, boy. <laughs> I feel like this film right here just has such an impact on pop culture. and Or not maybe pop culture, but horror pop culture. I think for yeah. horror fans, this has an impact. Um, even the homosexuality that's referred to in it and the acting by the aunt on how creepy and weird she is, uh, and Angela and Ricky's relationship and how the whole camp structured, like it very much is structured like a typical summer camp. You see the kids arriving, which yep. is what we, we don't see, I think in the other camp movies that we've talked about, we actually see the kids arriving. Yeah. I think the yep. only camp movies I've seen that in are like the... 80s camp comedies and cheerleader camp i think we see them arriving too. yes yep cheerleader yeah. camp too yep right so it's the kids arrive and the opening for sleepaway camp takes forever i remember the first time i saw that opening credits i was like holy fuck are we gonna get to the goddamn movie like, <laughs> yeah there? it does take a while right and you kind of hear the the sounds of the camp in the background and all the things that are happening but nobody's on in the camp and you got that really nasty chick that is such a bully to angela i judy i think yeah judy, yeah, judy. Yep. and the counselor and they're just bullies like just so 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 mean to angela um you have that creepy pedophile cook oh man like and i feel like in the 80s that was probably something that would happen like that was probably the real horror horror that they probably didn't do criminal reference checks as well or if any and they probably did have some fucking creepers that worked at camps like that would not surprise me yeah, well, I was saying, like, I mean, we hear stories about stuff like that in, like, uh, Cub Scouts. Yeah, that's true. We so, do, unfortunately. It does happen, right? So, yeah. you know, maybe that was playing on the fear at the time, too, because the scene where he dies is fucking awesome. Like, it's just so good. Oh, it is painful to watch, too. Right? Like, oh, like having burning waterfall on you, I can't even imagine. And then, like, the kind of the young sexual flirting. So, like how judy is liking like how they all have little crushes on each other and they have that like little dance that they go to it's yeah, just and, super cute yeah, and judy knows like that she's all hot because she's blossomed and everything so she's like looking towards the older guys now and then you got angela who's the quiet shy type that has like the guy one of the guys that's interested in her coming up to her trying his best to get her to like talk and to even smile well and, and he's buddies with Ricky, Ricky, Paul, yep. right? Paul's buddies with Ricky, so they're trying to like kind of build that friendship. And then throughout it, you start seeing people get killed that have wronged Angela. Yep. And I think the best part about this movie, and I you know other people have gone to is about the red herring, but even all the activities like the death in the outhouse, the death in the kitchen, like those are all things that are so summer campy. Yeah. Like so, so freaking summer campy and could easily happen. Yeah, and I love the way that they... uh like make you think the entire time it is Ricky that's doing all of this too. Like yeah. the, the way, like you were saying, the red herring, like the way they do that is really, really well done. And yeah, like it's showing like all the activities, but then also like, cause you get your softball games, you get your bow and arrow, your archery lessons, mm -hmm. you get them going out and camping in the woods. 
you get to see everything that's happening. And, you know, Judy's death, I, as being a female in those cabins, Ooh. you bring up shit like that, especially at that age. You're still trying to look cute for the boys and there is dances and stuff. And yeah, like how she's fucking killed, man. I felt that. I was like, Meh. I felt that and I'm a guy. <laughs> right? Like it's, it's, it's burn, baby, burn. Like it's, um, it's intense, but you don't see anything. No, it's just like just the shadows. Imagine, right? You can imagine the impact of it. Um, if you don't know what we're talking about and you haven't seen Sleepaway Camp, that's just watching it. Yeah. And then Meg is stabbed to death in the shower while getting ready to meet Mel. So, like, everyone that has wronged her is getting their conductance. And I remember I listened on a, uh, a podcast and they were talking about the kids that are killed that are doing a little sleep out. Yep. And it's because they threw sand at Angela and Ricky. Yep, from when uh, when she got tossed in the water when she was uh, not able to swim. Yes. And yep, the kids were just like throwing sand at her as she was walking by. Yes, so she went and got them too, right? And, but yep. yet again, that's something you would take kids out for a sleepover. And can you imagine as a counselor coming back and these kids are fucking dead in their sleeping bags? Like, oh, I would be mortified. And, and just it, like, oh. And, and the movie picks up. Like, it goes from kill kill and then it's like boom 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 boom. like it it builds it's like little hills and a roller coaster and then all of a sudden you're like oh my god and i feel like that sleeping big like obviously the other kills are traumatic too but when those kids are all killed i'm like yeah fuck that's when you know no one is safe right and and it's such a these kids would be out having a camping you know little trip the counselor leaves comes back so they're trying to figure out what's going on all this chaos on the campsite like you can feel the chaos and the tension i feel like this movie does a really good job of building that yeah it really does and then we get to well this is a spoiler for anyone who has not seen sleepaway camp like the biggest spoiler of all spoilers yep and if you have if you don't even know what we're talking about then yeah you go you see need this to movie skip now. over what we're going to say so when the reveal happened, Scott, think back to when you first saw it. Mm -hmm. What did you think? Well, I ended up seeing this is I ended up getting it spoiled for me because I seen part two first. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. And so but like but going back and finally watching part one, like I didn't know how it happened. So getting to that point and then just seeing the full view and reveal and the uh, noise that Angela makes, freaking bone chilling. You know, and, it's in, yeah. I think bone chilling is an interesting word that you used. Yeah, like it's because it, it's just uh, not what you would ever expect, especially going into a, like a summer camp slasher, like a slasher film like this. I feel for 1983, this movie was so forward thinking. Oh, they it have really was. A, homosexual relationship in it they have a woman that is upset that a child is one sex and wants that child to be a different sex mm -hmm. and goes to the part of dressing and faking medical records and when it is revealed that angela is actually a boy i remember thinking i remember being in shock and i remember being like fucking bravo 1983 yeah. sleepaway camp fucking bravo and i and i remember i was i watched this movie for the first time i didn't know anything about it this is back in 2011 and i was renting a basement apartment and i was going out with my girlfriend that night for ice cream dairy queen and i met up with her and i'm in line at dairy queen and i'll never forget this because i'm telling her about the movie right and then i'm like and then it's revealed that it's a girl but she has a penis <laughs> right at the end of, and I'm telling her this and people in Dairy Queen are turning around and staring at me because I have volume control issues as you know and she's like are you seriously doing this right now and I'm like yeah like it was a penis so she had a penis which would mean that it's a boy and like it was really shocking and she's like I don't ever want to see this movie you need to stop talking right now um <laughs> so when I met other people that liked horror and I was really excited to talk about Sleepaway Camp to because I'm honest with you when I would bring it up to people I, I brought it up to her and maybe one other friend they looked at me like I was a psychopath Oh, I like, believe how it. How could you enjoy this? Why do you think this is such a cool movie? And to become into a community that valued this movie, valued the kills in it, valued the setup of the camp, and valued that reveal was 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 a relief. You know, it was a yeah. relief to be like, not that I needed that 
validation, but it was nice to have it. Right. It's nice to be able to talk about it to someone and not actually look like you're a weirdo. Yes. Like, at least we're weirdos together. Right. Exactly. We embrace the weird to e- with each other. Right. So, yeah. Excellent movie for reflecting the camp culture. And I just think moving mountains at the time. Like, I just have a oh, for of sure. that film. And I think that it, it got, it had some balls, quite literally. Yeah. Um, so, the last one we're going to talk about from this era, well, that's not true. We're, we're just jumping up a little bit, is to Jason, Jason Lives Friday the 13th, part six, where Tommy just fucks everything up. Um, so true so true well Tommy if you just didn't stab corpuses then we wouldn't be in this situation you wouldn't have Frankenstein Jason after your ass I dig all the Friday movies with the exception of Goes to Hell which I don't hate it's just not my jam Um, but yeah like I know you're a Friday guy and a Friday guy yeah, you're a Friday guy. Yeah. Yes. Why am I saying you're not? Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> I think like I'm all of a sudden talking to myself like the mother from Sleepaway Camp. Oh, um, yeah. I got a bow, got a little thing yeah. on my finger to remind me. That's right. I can't <laughs> send the medical records. They wouldn't understand. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about the, the camp feel of this film? Um, with this one, uh, it is pretty much the one and only Friday the 13th film that actually involves children at the camp. And this is after Camp Crystal Lake gets, gets turned into like something Greenfield or something. Camp, Camp Forest, Forest Green. Green. Yep, Camp Forest Green. And they try to obviously forget about the legend of Jason that was there and just try to move on with it. But from my recollection, because I've watched this probably a handful of times. Huh. Is, what? I just, I'm just surprised you've only watched it a handful of times. Well, I usually, can't, I usually end up going one through four and then like the other ones, like, well one through five and then after that it just kind of like once it becomes undead i don't watch them nearly as much oh i didn't know that you were prejudiced oh i'm not prejudiced I, like, towards the friday movies i'll say even uh, the movie i can't stand jason x i still give a seven out of ten yeah so, but you rate high <laughs> you'll I be do. like the people showed up on set <laughs> well you gotta give them credit <laughs> i know you're such a nice dude anyway i'm sorry <laughs> but you, yeah just- i've I feel this one really doesn't do a great job of like the camp feel because they don't show any of the activities with the children besides like I think maybe a few small scenes and it's all like indoor stuff mm-hmm. if I remember correctly mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. in the cabin where like they're like something that one kid says the other one like I don't want to die or yeah like something like and I thought that line was really funny to be honest with you or when Jason's going through the cabin and they're and they're laying in their beds um I believe yeah, like, that happens in this one, right? Yeah, because it's yeah, because that actually like that scene right there builds a lot of tension because it does. You don't know if Jason because they're all hiding underneath their beds and Jason's just kind of walking through and like he don't care. He would kill whoever he needed to kill to get to like to uh, Tommy. That's right. That's and, right. But I will say like even though they didn't really do much with the kids like with the camp setting itself, the setting alone feels like the camp I was at. Like, the way the beds were, the mess hall, the dock, the canoes, like, where everything was lined up, it all felt like Camp Copacanic when I was going there when I was at a young age. And I think the kids add to it. They add a extra sense of thrill and anxiety. Um, yeah. You know, up to this point, the people had been going to, you know, Camp Kinsta Lake, we had the counselors there and stuff, but we didn't have the children as the risk factor. I feel like this was the movie that brought in the children as a risk factor. So even though it doesn't capture a lot of the experience of camp, it does build your anxiety a little bit in terms of what's going to happen to these campers. Because they're all pretty cute kids too, right? None of them are assholes. We don't get to know them long enough to see if any of them are assholes or not, but we definitely don't want them to die. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Right? So... The next set, so I have second round here, and the second round I just put is 1988, and we have Cheerleader Camp. So Cheerleader Camp is a movie that I saw very long time ago, and I just put it in here because I know that it's a pretty popular one. Um, it's about a bunch of cheerleaders. Like, it's so superficial. <laughs> I don't really go to oh, this camp where they sing and dance. Like, it's so silly. Oh, it um, so is, but it's so entertaining. But I think it really does capture what a, what a cheerleading camp would be. You know, they... They're learning how to do their cheers better. There's the mascot there that doesn't ever seem to get a break and is always kind of put to like the side. They have these cheer competitions. I just feel like when we look at theme camps, this represents what a theme camp would be very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, very well themed. And then Sleepaway Camp 2, Unhappy Campers. Ah, yes. 
1988. So this is your favorite slasher of all time. So I'm going to let you talk about it. Oh, yes. Yep. Sleepaway Camp 2, Unhappy Campers. Like Heather said, it is my all-time favorite slasher film. Um, Because this is around the era that, you know, Freddy is very popular. And, well, you get the killers that are, like, spouting one-liners here and there. And Angela takes it to the extreme in this film. Um, But this one I like because... If uh, it has like a good mix of like teenagers and a bit of the younger adults in this camp, and it focuses a lot on the counselors and the campers and like, the relationship between the campers and the counselors. Yes, yeah, yeah the really strong relationship because, like, you see, like, the more jockier guy that uh, I forget his name, but like, they like a lot of people look up to him and he's really well respected and then you have angela who's supposed to be like this goody goody two-shoe counselor and she gets like counselor of the week or whatever because but she is also freaking psychotic because any camper that breaks the rule she disposes of in one nasty way or another and she only wants happy rule following campers at this camp camp arawak if i remember correctly yep yeah and um but yeah, you get like a lot of the, this is where you get a lot of like the late 80s style punk teenagers. Like you got Allie, who's just an absolutely like terrible person. Yep. Uh, she's pretty much the Judy of this film. And she's like very promiscuous, loves to party and drink, very, uh, uh, talks a lot of shit back to all the counselors and disrespects authority. You got the stoner cup, the stoner sisters. Uh, and then you got like just the random jocks and just other individual characters they add to it. And the little kids that are going around sneaking up to windows in the girls' cabins and taking pictures of them getting undressed. Like this has like that total 80s camp vibe to it. You uh, don't really, I, I, you don't really get a lot of the like camp activities in this one as well, but you do get to like see a lot of the hiking in the woods. You get to see the, uh, one thing that I always remembered going to when I was younger is the like kind of like restroom area out in the middle of the woods that has like the screen door that you have to lock and go inside and use the bathroom. It has like the stalls, like it looks like a regular public restroom, but just out in the middle of the woods. Yep. And it has like the creaky swinging screen doors. I used to, Yeah. That you would hit like that would, that would fall back and bang, bang, yep. bang a couple times. Yeah. And I, I, cause that just brings up a story for me, but like we used to be in my, a uh, couple of my buddies, when we went to a camping ground, they had one of those and we were like 14 years old and we ended up finding the bathroom and then hanging out in it the entire night and brought our little boom box and was playing like Nirvana and like lighting incense and just hanging out in there. People thought we were smoking weed every time they'd walk in to use the bathroom and see these punk kids just chilling in the bathroom talking, but we're just sitting there talking, listening to music lighting incense for no real reason well probably because it smelled you were in a bathroom i mean yeah that's probably the reason actually (laughs) (laughs) just gonna go on a limb there and say that's probably the reason (laughs) yeah why we hung out there i have really no freaking idea oh you're weirdo so that makes sense it's true but yeah this just has a lot more of that like camp vibe that i remember and just the kills in it are ridiculously awesome especially the most iconic one would probably be the death of Allie being shoved down the fucking odd house. And you know what that is, Allie? What is that down there? Shit. That's because you're a shitty person and you shit, uh, you shit your life away. <laughs> just the lines that she uses and it's just great. <laughs> and it's interesting how she became this kind of moral avenger. You yeah. know what I mean? And her relationship with Molly, who she perceives to be the good girl and her expectations of Molly. Like, it's a very interesting character arch that's developed here. Very different from the first one. Yeah, well, I'll say, because in the first one, she's shy and won't talk. And in this one, it's like she just won't shut up. And she's well, like, and, and so she's a very high home. moral code, right? And it's yeah. like, and it makes sense, because the first sleepaway camp is where she kind of came to be her own, or his mm-hmm. own. I guess her, because she's chosen to go with being a female. Um, and the second one is just where she really enacts that voice and like all that frustration, all that anger at being bullied, she's able to kind of put into people that are assholes. And 
you know, I think that it's a really good follow up, and I think Pamela Springsteen was a great choice for that yeah. follow. -up. Um, I think she did a really good job, and I really like the two of them together. I think watching them back to back and seeing that character arc, even though it's a slasher, I do feel like there's a character arc there that is valuable and worth watching. Yep, I agree. And it also, there's one thing too that has the uh, one of my favorite things with these camp slashers the whole opening bonfire, urban legend campfire tale, talking about Angela the slasher. Oh, that's right. It all starts with these campfire tales, right? And now they have, you know, our urban legend ones that they can go back and listen to those because we yep. have so many good ones. <laughs> um, the next is we had the comical relief. So the rebirth of the camper slashers, but they came back in a funny way. So yes, there's some other slashers that we could talk about. And there's like some ghost ones that came up too, but I chose not to go into those. I chose to focus on some of the funnier ones. So stage fright is a musical that came out in 2004. It's it, uh, 2014. Uh, many, sorry, 2014. Uh, the reason why I said 2004 is because it's based for the original character, which is Minnie Driver, Kylie Kylie Swanson. Ah. Uh, is, that's who that was, right? Was yeah. singing for the haunting of the opera, which is a reference to the Phantom of the Opera. And she's murdered in front of her daughter. Well, in front of her kids. Her kids find out that she's been murdered. It's the star musical of this play. And then 10 years later in 2014, um, they're working at a camp with Milo, who is my favorite all-time singer. Like... Yeah, as oh soon as I seen Meatloaf was in this, I'm like, oh, Heather is going to love this Oh, movie. I love musicals, right? Like, that's like, and yeah, like, same the, here. The opening song that they do and the bus on the way there and how it continues when they get to the camp and how they're like, this is somewhere I can be myself. And it's great. And you really feel for the kids whose mom was murdered, Minnie Driver, at the beginning uh, 10 years ago in 2004. But it's predictable. Like, it I is. called who the killer was right away. Um, I don't think it was difficult to figure out who the killer was, but man, did the killer have some good singing and lines that he said too. Oh, it was so great. And the, the fact that they use like the themed costume of the Kabuki man. Yeah, it was so good. And Meatloaf is so good. And Meatloaf is a good actor, man. He was actually a trained stage actor before he became a magician, like a, a singer um, and batter to hell and stuff like that. And Meatloaf is a nickname that his dad gave him because he was always so big. But anyway, I will not go on in my <laughs> Meatloaf trivia anymore. But it is such a fun musical. And it has some pretty decent kills for a musical. Like, Yeah, it really does. And I, and I do love how they capture the musical side of summer camp on how if you went to this camp, all you would be doing is acting all day and you would be do, you would have someone that does the stage production and how serious they would have to be for that. And, and all the different acting classes, like I took acting classes when I was young and I only took it like once a week and they would make us do things like we would have to learn how to walk. We would have to do voice training, like hours of that. Wow. And it's, it's a lot of work. And I was in some, like I was in a theater camp that was pretty well known in this era. I was a theater Aquarius, which is a fairly well known theater company in Hamilton, Ontario, nowhere near like, you know, big time or anything like that. But if they made us do that stuff there, I can't imagine what would happen at a musical camp like this. So I feel like this captures it well and it kind of brings it fresh. Like it's, it's a camp that you would see nowadays. And I think that connects with people more. Yeah, I was like, because once again, it kind of ties in with that whole theme camp. Right? Yeah, and it's just, it's a cool, it's a cool film with some really good actors in it. So then the next is The Final Girls. Oh, oh man, like, steal my beating heart. Yeah, this um, movie is just, it pulls on the heartstrings, it's funny, it's charming, it's just a perfect movie for me. Yeah, like, how likable. So there's... You know, at the beginning, um, you meet this young lady named Max, and her mother starred in this camp bloodbath, which looked like, you know, looks like Jason, basically, yeah. any kind of Jason film, and uh, she's she's killed, and she they're killed in a car accident, so, you know, she was in this movie, she had her daughter, her and her daughter are leaving, I guess, an audition place or something like that, and there's a car accident, she passes away, and her daughter and her friends go and they watch the anniversary when the movie's released, so it'd be like us going to watch Friday the 13th in the movie theater. Yeah. 
and there's a fire in the theater and they end up getting sucked into the film and it is so funny like, oh it's hilarious and the plays on like the mask is so over the top like it's so ridiculous yeah it kind of looks like a uh like the totem pole or like the tiki mask oh my goodness it was and they took every trope and they exaggerated it right like the the, the douchebag and yeah, the, the badass jock. girl and and well-known actors like you knew those people like you'd be like yeah. oh he's here or he's from like and they're not big names but people that if you watch television you're like oh i've seen you you're in pitch perfect or you're on parks and rec like you just saw people that you recognized and you were like oh, I, i've seen you before um man like talk about entertaining yeah like and like it it's one of those films i just have to say it just has heart like you it know does. it like it wears its love for the slashers on its sleeves and like it is proud to display them because it hits the stereotypical characters on the head and over exaggerates them and like you have the group that you know got sucked into the movie you got the guy that's like like one of us that would be oh this is one of the best movies oh this scene's about to happen we we can't be here during this scene and like he well, knows, no he like, thought he could be there and then he gets killed anyway which is like right <laughs> which is hilarious um and even though this is a, a movie with no campers being there um so i know i kind of broke my rules a little bit i just decided to talk about it because i just thought it was so funny and it was such a good parody on the camp genre um yeah i just enjoyed it a lot if you haven't seen it and even the ending like <laughs> they leave it is really funny yeah too. the yeah i thought that was really good and I, ho I i hope there is a sequel to this somehow some way down the road right so yeah it's just a really really fun look on the camp genre now and then finally you might be the killer 2018 um also put comical yep. uh, i i had a hard time because the chick that plays chuck is in this annoys the shit out of me I'm not a fan of her i find her annoying in almost everything she's in so that was hard for me to get through but i did enjoy the concept of it and i love the song Oh, yeah. I downloaded it onto Spotify. Did you really? So, oh, yeah. And it's on my list. I actually have a list called Angry Women. And it's and it's just like songs of chicks that I think are mad. And <laughs> that's how I named my beats. It's great. My, my lists are pretty funny. Um, but yeah, like I really dug this song. I enjoyed this. But if I was given a chance to watch, like if someone said Final Girls or You Might Be the Killer, I would probably watch Final Girls again. Um, not because I think it's a better movie. I just enjoyed it more. But this I one think was it is a better movie, good. I think. Um, I, this one was good though, like the whole concept oh, yeah. of the mask being evil. Then again, no kids on the on the on the camp yet. Actually, no, there was kids on the camp. You do see them because there's some kayaking, or maybe that's the summer before, and they're doing a yeah. flashback. Um, when he gets pushed into the water, and there's some kids there. Yep, that's right. I guess it's just the training of the counselors that they're talking about, but it's the whole concept of. You know, early on in the film, this guy's freaking out. He's covered in blood. And then he calls his friend who works at a video store, which, like, for 19, 2018, I don't, is it a video store or comic book store? Like, uh, it was almost like a weird, like, spooky thrift store because I had, like, comic books, horror movies, like, and old yeah. stuff and just, like, occult books. It was yeah, weird. Yeah, so it was a little bit of everything. So, yeah, she's, and that's where it comes to, like, you, well, you might be the killer. And then kind of working through what has to happen. It was very clever. And I give it tons of credit for being inventive in the genre in 2018. I definitely think all these movies that we talked about today are must-see for horror fans. Yeah, absolutely. And this one, like, I love the way they structured it. Like, the whole just going backwards and forwards and just kind of figuring out where everything went wrong and how it happened. And, like, it's just uh, the way they structured this entire story was very unique. Absolutely. Uh, yes, yeah, so... I guess I will jump into uh, my part of the conversation, which is Cabin in the Woods horror films. And so before I really kind of dive into any of the stuff I looked up, I was just going to say, like, you know, Cabin in the Woods is just a popular genre from, like, the 80s and on. And I think what the reasons is is because people love to, quote-unquote, go up north to the cabin, like, for a vacation, to get away from things, to just kind of be out in the woods, away from technology for the most part society kind of like an adult campground with booze you, and pot yep, and banging yep exactly where you can yeah. just go and just be free have fun no cares no worries the and the reason it's so nice is because you're isolated out in the countryside and what makes for a better horror film 
than isolation. And Cabin in the Woods horror films have definitely taken that. The Cabin in the Woods has been an established device in horror films for a considerable amount of time, from offering brief respite for the titular character in the original Frankenstein to becoming a predominant setting during the American slasher boom in the 1980s. Since then, they have commanded a specific aura which has been instilled in viewers' minds primarily as a place of fear, but also for characters to go to have a defining, psychologically altering experience. In the subsequent years following the decline of the slasher subgenre, the cabin has begun to make a comeback and has rebranded itself as a home for stories stretching from psychological thrillers to coming-of-age comedies. Inherently situated in a wild or remote area, they often act as a vessel for characters' inner solitude and serve as an ideal place for catharsis or the purging of demons, both literally and figuratively. And, like, it's pretty much true, like, because, yeah, like, a lot of the stuff from the early like the 80s stuff was kind of like you know the campground style slashers and this and that and like the modern era does take more of a psychological look into horror films like especially with characters like being isolated in cabins all right so we'll start with 2013's honeymoon it's a directorial debut from lee janiak and is a playful look at the way doubts surrounding marriage can manifest themselves within a science fiction paradigm the romantic honeymoon of B and Paul, Rose Leslie, and Harry Treadaway is distributed or is disturbed by the strange going ons in the woods outside the cabin where B was raised. A strongly suggested alien interaction later, and B mutates from overnight from newlywed bliss into invasion of the body snatchers horror. This movie uh, really uh, covers the whole uh, newfound love of a newlywed couple. And then the inherent uh, mistrust when things start going crazy and they are completely isolated from the rest of the world. Um, and one thing I wanted to bring up that would uh, put a smile on, on Heather's face is they try to uh, pretend this cabinet is in Canada. What is with everyone in Canada? I don't know. And like they do. Uh, because we don't have Kanye West running for our prime minister. That's probably the biggest reason right there. He's sus. Walk, Jesus, walk with me. Anyway. I'm a gay fish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I felt this movie felt was perfect because it shows the deterioration of trust between two people. Uh, the cabin fever, if you will, because yeah, after B goes out in the woods, she ends up like her husband ends up finding her naked out in the woods late at night and like brings her back and she just starts acting really weird like he finds like a, a notebook saying uh my name is b and i am married to this and i i like this this is my favorite food this is my favorite color and he sees it written in this notebook over and over and over again and you see and he sees her rehearsing lines in the mirror and so he starts getting very suspicious of things happening right away and like it just kind of he realizes that they are trapped out here alone not near anybody. I think the closest thing is this like old like rinky dink like restaurant that's also got some really strange people in it. And like he ends up just basically tying her up <laughs> and forcing her to admit that she is not really B. And when she finally admits that he freaks out and then it gives there's a uh, scene where he pulls something out from inside of her. And Ooh. uh yeah, it's uh highly disturbing but it's yeah pretty much just taken over her body and mind controlled her for the most part and like she's like starting to lose her mind and forget like who she is and she's like oh because she escapes and they t uh she ends up knocking him out and she puts him on a boat and she's going i need to get you to safety because these aliens are going to kill they're going to kill you if they see you here you need to hide you need to hide and she's so just out of her mind that she ties an anchor around his feet and then throws him in the lake to hide and then that's the end of him. Wow. It sounds like a really depressing film. It it kind of was, but man, it's such a well done film. Like and it's just filled with so much tension. Like the acting between these two, it's like incredible. Hmm. So you recommend checking it out? Yes, I highly recommend this one because yeah, it's definitely uh it definitely like another one of those relationship films. Like you see the fresh love newlyweds and then just like it just starts. He does watch his shit fall apart. 
I, I guess I guess I'm a ro- I'm an anti romantic. He's like loving real. <laughs> this proves it. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. That's more me than you. <laughs> oh, you know I'm a you know I'm a romantic. I know, and I'm all like fuck love. <laughs> Fuck love, just just fuck. Except from a micmac, me and my <laughs> puppy. That's all I need. Um, uh, but yeah, this one I know you have. You and I have both seen. Oh shit! No, what's this one again, Scott? Smart ass. <laughs> but uh, this is probably one of the more popular of the Cabin in the Woods horror films, especially in modern times, and that is Cabin in the Woods from two thousand eleven. Oh, two thousand eleven. Yeah. Wow, I know it's like so old, like old. I bet you never what, never seen. What it. happened in this one, Scott? Oh, t- <laughs> God, I hate you. <laughs> anyway, please tell us what happened in this one. Scott. Oh, in perhaps the most modern deconstruction of horror conventions, Drew Goddard and Joss Whedon caught most people off guard with this astute and unexpectedly savvy horror comedy. Setting itself up as just about the most conventional Cabin in the Woods horror film possible, it then takes a sly turn and we become literally aware of the engine room that runs this and suggestively every horror film ever made. And the purpose of this was to kind of just turn the genre on its head. And man, does this film do that? Because it's, yeah, like, obviously, probably everyone has seen this film if you're a horror fan. Like, it's just the typical people are going to a Cabin in the Woods. They here's some noise in the cellar. They go down to the cellar and they find all these weird artifacts and they end up looking at one. And like, I think it was the, uh, the diary. Yeah. It was the diary for this one. And they read the diary out loud, which summons undead hillbillies. (laughs) What I love about that is they're all playing with different shit or like this actual awkward sexual tension in between the, the two characters that are like kind of supposed to hook up. And then they all become like, the scholar, the the athletic the slut, the slut, and like they go out to have sex in the fucking flowers and shit. I do that, or she does her sexy dance with like the bear and shit. Like, and she starts making out with the head of the oh bear. Oh my god, it's so but, great! And I love it because it's like they cover all of the reasons why these people are acting like this. Because they're like, oh yeah, we uh, added these uh, pheromones into her hair dye that just makes her more sexually active and just wants to like be very like it makes her ditzy but she wants to be like very sexually active and yeah. cause, like before that i think she was a brunette before she dyed her hair blonde is what she was yeah. saying in the movie yeah i think so and she also like it's pretty like her and her boyfriend are into each other but they're not like and even like the part where the stoner guys like yeah she's like oh whatever his name is chris is always like that he's like chris has a gpa of 4.0 like <laughs> Like, right. he wants to be, like, a really smart jock, and then he starts acting like a big asshole. Um, and then I I love this movie, and I forced a lot of people to watch this movie that are so did I. horror fans. And, like, you spend a lot of time being like, okay, you get it? Okay, no, the yeah. good part's coming. <laughs> okay, no, the good part, when they go down the elevator, and they're going to go down. Do you see that? That's like Pinhead, yeah. but it's you not Pinhead. Have, look at that creepy ballerina. <laughs> But yeah, this is one like one of my uh, favorite like uh, horror comedies because like it does pick on all of the tropes from slasher films to like the Cabin in the Woods style films. Because even with uh, Chris Hemsworth, like being the 4.0 smart jock, he ends up uh, like ends up being like the dumb jock that makes all the bad decisions. Because once again, they spray this like chemical in the air and make him just dumb. Because everything's being controlled from a master control room. And each artifact in the cellar represents a different creature they could have accidentally summoned to kill them off. Because what they are trying to do is they are trying to produce these characters to be sacrificed to appease this elderly god demon. And it's a great movie. And 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 who's the lady at the end? Is oh, that it, is Sigourney Weaver. That's who it is. I was going to say, but I didn't want to get it wrong. It's just a good, and the ending's good too. I always wanted to make a sequel, but you know what? Maybe there's just some things that shouldn't have a sequel to it. Yeah, like they've talked about it multiple times, but like I, I don't think they're ever any, able to go anywhere with it. No, um, but, things are better to the imagination. Yeah, and the one thing I like about this though is just it shows like the fun party atmosphere of being in the cabin. Because that's what they're kind of there for is just a party. I mean, you got your stoner, you got your drinking people, you got people just wanting to have sex. Like, when you're that you're age, only one, one person. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I'm that person. <laughs> yeah, I know you're pretty much that person as well. You're not as, well, as so. fun as me, Scott. Well, you try. You try. Hey, hey, 
Hey, I'm fun, just not to the extent of you fun. Yeah, that's true. You're uh, you're a bit up there. I am. I am. Uh, and then this one uh, is another really well-known horror film from the modern times, and that would be because you were home. Because you were home, The Strangers. Where this one is a horror slasher film that tells the story of couple Kristen and James and how they were tortured by three completely masked strangers in their vacation home. And just to be clear, the quote is, you were home. Yes. Just so you, not because. We just said because because we're, oh, oh, yeah. we're trying to set it up. Yeah. <laughs> trying to set it up like I'm trying to set up my next day. Wait, That's what? right. <laughs> Man, this movie's so good. I I saw this movie. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I saw this movie with some friends, and I remember we all loved it and thought that it was sick. And what happens? There's just an, a sense of dread throughout this entire film. Yeah, um, because I didn't actually see this till probably 2014, 2015. Like, it took me a while to get around to seeing this one, because I've heard about it, and I know, that shocked face. Trust me, I know. <laughs> um, but when I seen it, like, man, this was a great home invasion horror film that fits that isolation and terror perfectly. Because, yeah, they can scream all they want, but there is no one around them. Well, and the worst part is their buddy shows up at one point, because they were, sup- another film where they, the guy proposes and she says no. Yeah, and then going to, onto a, into their vacation, home and they're afterwards. still and they're leaving a wedding. Yeah, and then they're going to this, and then their buddy comes to check on them, and he gets killed, and he gets killed in like the saddest way that you feel so shitty. Like everything that happens in this, and and there's no reason, there's no reason that these people tend to engage in this. It almost gives you that feel of the purge, like killing for no reason. Yeah, um, like they have no motive. They have no motive, and I thought Liv Tyler, Liv T- Tyler was awesome in this. Same with Scott Spedman, or Speedman. He was excellent. Yeah, like you could tell they were a uh, couple that was dealing with a lot. Yeah, and they're like, acting like, and even how there's scenes where Dollface, or maybe it's not Dollface, it's um, the man in the mask is in the back, and like you see the face as she's standing in the middle of the living room. Like it was just filmed so well. Yeah, because I was going to say, because this one, like, you could definitely tell it was, like, inspired by uh, Halloween a little bit because of the way they would just place the characters in the background, and they wouldn't do anything. They would just be standing there, but it's just enough to give you that freaking sense of dread. Absolutely. And I have to say, like, yeah, their friend uh, that ends up getting killed, it's, like, heartbreaking, and I just got to bring it up because I tend to bring it up every show. That's Dennis Reynolds from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, man. Best show of all time. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I and I like the sequel. I like Strangers Six. Pray at Night. I It's a different movie. I actually like it better feel. than this film. It's more slashery. Like, mm-hmm. this one is more of a home invasion, and it's a slower burn, and you're kind of thinking they might make it out. They don't. Well, no. I guess technically Liv Tyler does at the end. She's still alive. Oh, she is. That's right. right. So, you know, you kind of are unsure of what her fate is there. But, and she's wearing the engagement ring at the end. Like, oh my God, it's just a pull on your heart strings. But yes, it definitely does the isolation stuff well. Yeah. And that is like perfect for what these Cabin in the Woods horror films are all about is the isolation. And like, yeah, this one, like, because I don't think there was anybody around for Miles. No, I don't believe so. I think that was the point of it. Mm -hmm. Just to get away from everything. Have a romantic, like... I don't know. I don't find that romantic. If someone's like, I want to take you out where there's no one around, I'd be like, no Starbucks? <laughs> no Starbucks? Come on now. <laughs> no liquor store? No place to go get yum yums? I don't know <laughs> if I'm down with that shit. Like, I'm such a city girl. Like, I oh, pretend I'm... to be country. Like, I like going to cottages and I go to country shit for a weekend, but I am so a city girl. Me too. I am a city guy. I like to be around everything. Like, I love my little getaways to, like, cabins and stuff like that, but, like, I gotta be near uh, civilization. So if we were in Cabin in the Woods, which character would you be? I think I know which one you are. I would totally be the stoner. Yeah, that's totally who you would be. Who do you think I'd be? Um, God, I think you would be the uh, blonde party girl. The slut. It, uh, I wasn't going to say that word, but yes. Oh, I'd be banging. If I'm I know you'd out, be banging. I'm going out banging. Let me and I'd be, the, I'd be the stoner that's like oblivious to the redhead that's sitting on him. Yeah. Yeah, you would be. <laughs> be too high. Because I got high. Because I got high. 
because I got high. Ba -da -da -ba -ba -ba. I right. was going to clean my room, but then I got high. Ooh. All right. You get <laughs> to the next movie. All right. So, well, the next one I wanted to bring up is Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Oh, this movie. <laughs> Bless this movie's heart. It's, once again, one of those kind of like the final girls where it's just got this heart to it and it's charming and but it's also over the top violent and gory and fucking hilarious. What I really like about those movies I just watched it today is that they fake it as like a suicide. They're like, all these kids killed themselves. Yeah, they're like in a suicide cult. <laughs> a suicide cult. And like the deaths are just so over the top and you feel so bad for Dylan Tucker and their cabin is so rustic and so like you know, retro, and I did find the love story a little vomity, but I, I, I thought Dale was super cute. Like oh, he is like the most lovable guy ever. Like I would go bowling with Dale. Oh Why hell not? yeah! <laughs> Scott's I mean, like, me first, bitch. <laughs> well, and I just, I just love uh, how Tucker is like trying to convince Dale, like, oh, you just gotta walk up to him and talk to them. And then Dale just walks up there with a scythe and, like, starts talking to the kids. So you guys are going up in the woods, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. It's great. It's great. No, it's a good movie, in it, and the kills in it are great. It's a funny comedy. The whole isolated cabin thing and these kids being up camping and the creepy camp story they tell and then how it's twisted around at the end. An easy watch, a fun watch, makes fun of itself, makes fun of all the like, – and even the girl that's all, like, done up and she's running around in the heels and – it's it's just great. It's a fun yeah, yeah. Because it's like I read a review somewhere that put this as uh, this movie is two different films in one. Tucker and Dale is your buddy comedy camping movie, and then you got the teenagers that are in an eighty slasher film. You know, I really thought it was going to be supernatural at some point. Like I thought maybe they were going to have to build like. Uh, come together and have to fight back against some kind of evil force but that didn't happen it was exactly what you thought it was going to be like it was basically yeah. a lack of communication i love how they tied in how the chick was taking psychology and she wanted to like increase communications between people like it was just really clever it was a really clever fun film um totally yeah. recommend it sad that i missed it but that's what we have our first time watches for and scott recommended it and thank you scott yeah you're welcome i'm glad you loved it because i knew you would like it was and like it's proved that you somewhat have a sense of some sense of humor because you find right? these pictures hilarious. Yeah, well, every movie oh, we've man. talked about so far, I've doll been... face when she shows up, you're like. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do have a dark sense of humor too. Oh, man, but like... Stab him in the eye again. Because <laughs> you were home. <laughs> <laughs> you still got the line right, but that's fine. Um, oh, damn it. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I'm taking away my horror card. I'm walking off the show. You know what? Show. There is no such thing as horror cards. I hate to break it to you. <laughs> well, I've thought um, about I, making them. I just paid $100 big... for one. Who, what? Um, oh, no. I thought I was in a special club, and I'm Was not. that something that Brandon gave you? Maybe. Yeah. You got to be careful with that, dude. You got to be careful. Smooth he, criminal, that one. He sure is. Sure is. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, anyway. Yeah, I guess oh, we, we should get, keep on going. Uh, we got uh three more technically oh my god how many movies yeah. did you pick oh. anyway. <laughs> but the next one is uh another one that i know both of us have seen and that is cabin fever from 2002 the good one yes the good one i'd never bothered watching that remake because i heard it was pretty much scene for scene like the exact same movie just yeah i wrong. heard that too and i maybe i will because i don't have beef with remakes i just thought that was kind of close to remake a movie <laughs> like, yeah like it wasn't very far between like like how long that film had been out like it'd be like me wanting to remake it follows <laughs> <laughs> right i'd be like oh man i like this so much you know what i'm remaking it follows <laughs> like right now five years later like it doesn't seem like that makes a lot of sense but anyway yeah but yeah this is pretty much another one where a uh, bunch of uh college i would say college age young adults go up to a cabin to get away for a while and they end up, uh, well, one of them ends up running into this uh, hunter out in the woods who ended up contracting a infectious flesh-eating virus. And he accidentally, I think it was, if I'm trying to remember, it's been a little while, but I think he accidentally shoots him and he falls down a ravine. And, like, the dude goes running back and pretending nothing happened. And then later that evening, the guy that fell down that ravine comes back and actually shows up to the cabin and he looks even worse. Like his skin is like 
oozing off. He's covered in blood. He ends up like coughing on the truck, covering the truck in yeah, germs. Yeah, everything gets covered blood. in germs. It's like COVID. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they end Everywhere. up catching him on fire, which is like yes. the poor, 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 poor guy. <laughs> yeah, you feel so bad for him, right? Like you just want to put the put the pork out of this misery. But I remember this scene, like where she's shaving her legs and her skin. Oh like, my god. <laughs> water oh my god and she convinces that dude to fuck her and she gets it gives it to him oh, that's a different that's a different girl too oh yeah that's right like oh my yeah, god it's just so it's so gross. dark and just so good like water supply shit is so scary yeah and like it's like the flint water crisis right Cabin fever yeah pretty much and i mean like in a and i love the fact that the asshole character is the only one that ends up not drinking the water the entire time like, and he ends up just drinking beer and, like, ends up sneaking out into a freaking uh, mine or a cave or something like that to hide out. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. And yeah. Then, like, everyone else is dead because for some weird reason, the hillbillies go crazy that live in this town and come up to this cabin and start killing them. And I, I think it's once they find out they had that, that disease, they were trying to, like, make sure they stayed up there and just killed them. But, uh, and then, yeah, when he comes out of the cab- the cabin, I made it, I'm alive, I'm the only one. And then he just gets shot to death by all the hillbillies. Which was, like, reminding you of Night of the Living Dead, right? Yes, and, but at the same time, like, I didn't feel bad for this guy. I was more like, yes, fucker deserved it, because <laughs> he was so the angry. asshole. You mean you didn't laugh all through this movie? You were like, <laughs> I was scared. Oh, I, no, I, I laughed at, uh. The kung fu flipping uh, kid at the store, pancakes, and starts doing cartwheels, and just like, what the hell is going oh, on? Oh, I don't here? remember that piece of that movie. That, yeah, that's something you remember that I do not. Oh, it is so bizarre. And then, well, then you got the uh, the deputy that shows up and calls everybody buddy, and he's like talking about how he's drinking with the girls and gonna drink a forty with the girls at uh, after he gets off his shift if they want to come with him. <laughs> I don't remember that piece at all. I just remember the gore, to be honest. Yeah, like the because I when I watched this movie, I watched it three times back to back because I just loved it that much originally. Mm. And but yeah, like like you were saying with the whole shaving of the legs, that scene. Even though I've watched this movie so many damn times, it still makes me freaking cringe. And you still don't shave your legs. I know. I just shave my head. Makes it even scarier. (laughs) (laughs) And my balls. I had to put that out nice. there. Nice. No, no, leave that in, Scott. I no, want to. That's what I'm I had to put that out there. Let everybody know. Oh, you're just trying to put your put everything that you have to offer. Brendan Orlick, if you're listening, Scott is coming full at you for this date. Yeah, Look yeah, at yeah, that. Yeah, baby. <laughs> oh, my God. How do, you, how do I compete with this? I don't understand. Smoke show Crossford. So... <laughs> oh my god get to your next movies get all to right your, so get to your boys here because these are your bad boys that you love yep and i was gonna say i saved the grandfathers of the cabin in the woods horror films the best the best cabin in the woods horror films in my opinion for last and that is evil dead and evil dead 2 like because i can guarantee that these are pretty much where the cabin in the woods horror films got their ideas from after this film because uh, absolutely but the first evil dead it was actually based off a short film from sam raimi called within the woods which for anybody that wants to see it it is on youtube you can check that out it's very 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 low budget but it's still pretty cool to see where the original story even came more from. low budget than evil dead yeah because he only had i think a thousand dollars to do this little short oh man it was like it was like a 10 minute oh, but a thousand dollars back in 1980 it's probably pretty good money yeah, and I was saying he had to make it to sell the idea of Evil Dead when he was mm. trying to get it made. So, like, that's that's what he had to do. And it's like uh, Bruce Campbell is playing Ash in that as well. Very cool. But, yep, yeah, it's the, you know, obviously the Evil Dead is Ash, his girlfriend Linda, his sister Cheryl, and his friends Scott and Shelley hike into the woods to a cabin for a fun night away. Well, they don't technically hike. They drive across the bridge on this old mobile, but close enough. And uh, <laughs> But they accidentally decide to read from this old book they find in a cellar that is covered in human flesh and it is called the Necronomicon which I'm sorry but if you find a book that's covered in flesh written with this ancient text would you be reading it Heather? You would. I would not. You would be like hey look what I found Heather. I found this book. 
Now, I would not be the idiot from Evil Dead, uh, the remake, no, and going, totally oh, I'm going to read this out loud. Okay, no. you would open it. I disagree with you 100%. Well, you would no, open I, it. I would open it. I just would not be reading it out loud. You read it in your head. Yes, because if you read it in your head, you're fine. It's when you read it out loud, you're saying the incantations. That's what summons the Deadites. Ah, uh, okay. The Candarian demons. <laughs> <laughs> I would only read it in my head and no one would know. <laughs> exactly. I would know how to summon the demons on my own terms. <laughs> <laughs> my demons, my time. Yes, but I get man, this film is just like the ass assault on the senses, like the first one, because it is pure visceral horror at its like, it's very low budget, but it's still like at its finest, like holds a lot of terror, builds up a lot of suspense. And, like, it's just freaking creepy the way that it is filmed because, like, they are pretty much surrounded by an invisible evil force outside of this cabin and that can possess your friends. And, yep, once again, it's isolation and it's uh, literally cabin fever where people are going nuts and can't trust each other because the demons are possessing one another and causing all these issues. It is just super low budget but man is this film like effective because i remember we watched this together uh back in january yeah we did and, and what did you think of it well i i don't think i can add anything of great value that you haven't already said to be quite frank with you i thought that it is a movie that captures a, a, a godfather of horror it really looked at how to use gore effectively practical effects effectively um the whole ancient evil possession thing, not knowing what's going to happen, pretty good acting. And some of the things that the actors and actresses had to go through upon the making of Evil Dead is, is intense enough and explains a lot of those scenes. Um, and I, you wonder how much was acting and how much was reality. Yeah. You know, and I, I have a lot of respect for what that film has done. And I can see why it's a classic and using a small set really when you look at it and using the characters well and the ending was very like oh you know <laughs> i guess there's no happy ending here really <laughs> right and, i mean you just chopped up everybody and you it it takes itself seriously and then evil dead 2 is more yuck nuck, 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 nuck. Yep, that's um, where it goes in the street. Three Stooges route, I would say. It does. And then, you know, you get Army of Darkness, which, which is, is full-blown Three Stooges. Right. So it, it's it's interesting, the, the, the shift that it took. But this one alone and then the remake was very good as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I meant to put the remake on here as well, cause, but, like, you know, we, I figured we'd bring it up with the Evil Dead stuff. Because, yeah, that... Yeah. I thought that was a really well done A film. lot of blood in the remake. Yeah, and I thought their reasoning for going to the woods and to this cabin and not just going there to just have another vacation stay like every cabin in the woods film they're going there to detox their friend from freaking heroin yeah. and like they actually you know have a nurse there with them and everything like like they're doing this in a kind of a smart way like without taking her to a hospital and rehabilitation herself like but like trying to do this on their own mm -hmm. Uh, the only dumb part is you got that dumb idiot that finds the book and decides to read these incantations out loud for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> so, but Scott? That I would not read them out loud. Like I said, I would be silently reading them. I know, you're them. super offended that I think you would read it out loud. Okay, Scott. I, I would not get us killed. You would read it in your head. Yeah, okay. I, if anything, I would probably be the Ash, uh, uh, Ash character in the part one, just getting his ass kicked constantly. <laughs> Yeah, I'd die. I'd be the chick that got fucked up first. Yeah, I'll say, sure. yeah, like, I, I, I don't know. I think you would, uh, yeah, I'd say you'd be about halfway through the movie. Yeah, I think so, at least. Yeah, I wouldn't live till the end. I, and I would um, actually probably not live very far either, <laughs> to be truthful. But these two movies back to back, like, talk about the starting of a genre starting talking about a piece of horror history you know it's it's those movies that are up there love them or hate them lukewarm on them whatever you may be respect they deserve respect yep for what they did and what they continue to do to this day yeah and you better respect these films damn it no <laughs> <laughs> well you have to because bruce campbell's from michigan isn't he uh yes i was gonna say like the the one thing i wanted to bring up about the original evil dead is they actually were 
originally wanting to film this in Royal Oak, Michigan, but they could not get the funding for it here in Michigan. So they had to resort to a cabin in the woods in Morristown, Tennessee. Tennessee. But yeah, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell are both from Royal Oak, Michigan. So they're, our, they're my hometown heroes that I am proud to say came from Michigan. That's awesome. No, I think it's a really awesome. And I'm glad you, you showed me Evil Dead and watching the remake and Evil Dead 2 as well. And I've seen Army of Darkness. And I, I feel like now that I have that on my horror card, you know, like a, I guess like a dance card, I feel like I've actually, you know, proven Brendan Orlick right that I just started watching movies this year. <laughs> so, um, but no, all joking aside, I'm, I think they're really solid films. And you do a much better job of talking about them than I do because of your passion for them. But yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, because I've watched these. I've probably before we did these first time watches, I'd wa- I would watch these films probably at least four times a year. Though I will say, if I since I am probably going to the cabin uh, in the UP here in the middle of August, I will probably be bringing every one of these cabin in the woods films with me to watch. Just because if there is an evening where it's shitty weather or whatever, and we're stuck inside. Oh, you're damn right. I'm going to be forcing some of my friends and cousins to watch some messed up horror Don't films. Don't laugh too hard woods. during The Strangers, okay? Don't be like, oh my God, guys, isn't this hilarious? <laughs> I'll try my best. I will try to keep it under control. So funny. That's what, <laughs> they'll get the one-year-old to watch them, okay? Like, maybe wait till the one-year-old's in bed. We don't well, you want... got to raise them correctly. Yeah, that's true. You never know on the kid, right? Good point. You never know because someone's kids could be totally into that. So then, yeah, and, it's, and it's someone else's kids, so I don't have to worry about that's that. That's true. You can bring <laughs> someone else's kids. Um, so this concludes our section for uh, camping and cabins in the wood horror. Hopefully you guys enjoyed our little, you know, review of some well-known films and maybe not some not so well-known films uh, that hopefully you can add to your collection as we move into these hot, hot summer months. And for our final segment today, we're going to be moving into Out of the Dark. And we had something else planned because it's the 20th anniversary the Scary Movie was released. And I'm a huge Scary Movie fan. And there was this article I found and I sent it to Scott. And we were going to talk all about that. But then we got some pretty big news today that every single uh, horror podcast Facebook page has shared. So, yep. Scott, I let you do the honors. All right. Well, I went uh, even further with this and grabbed all the dates of when they are going to be released now. But we are talking about, unfortunately, due to COVID and the fact that a lot of these theaters are not going to be opening, especially in the States, anytime soon. uh, The biggest news was Halloween Kills got pushed back from October of this year to October 15th of 2021. And not only that, But since Halloween Kills got pushed back, that means Halloween Ends got pushed back because Halloween Ends was supposed to be out in 2021, and now that is getting released in 2022. There was also news of Purge 5, Forever Purge. It got pushed uh, to July 9th of 2021. Um, And then St. Maud also, which was originally supposed to be released July 17th of this month, um, or of this year, but is now postponed indefinitely. They have not given a date for it at all. And also, one more, Candyman has been pushed back from September 25th to October 16th of 2020. So that one is still coming out this year at this time. Mm -hmm. But man, like COVID has definitely done its number on these poor things. I don't think we should say COVID, our reaction to COVID. Yeah, yes. Very, very good point. You know, and people's either engagement in doing what they're supposed to be doing or non-engagement in what they're supposed to be doing (laughs) has played a lot into this too, right? So, um, but yeah, what are your thoughts on this, Scott? Um, My thoughts are, I completely understand like why they put, why they're pushing these films back. And I don't mind that they're pushing them back, you know? The way I look at it is, well, 2021, we're going to have an awesome year for horror films then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I understand there is a fervent fandom for Halloween, especially. And I know a lot of people that are very upset about this. They want it to go VOD, which I could see them wanting to do that. But when it comes to a franchise like Halloween, you want that in theaters. Well, it's true. It's not like Halloween 6. Right. This is you like know, a reinvigoration of the Halloween franchise. Yeah. Yeah. And 
and you know that this, that, that this movie will get asses in seats. And if you want the theaters to stick around and survive, yes, it would be nice for us personally to get it on VOD. But wouldn't it be better for the theaters who, when they do finally open back up, are not going to already, they're already going to be struggling to have films to show. So won't it be better to have these films that will actually bring asses to the seats and sell tickets? And yeah. like, uh, that's the way I look at it. Like the ones I don't uh, like, same with The Purge. I know that always brings people to theaters. Candyman is definitely one that would bring people to theaters. So I understand these big films wanting to be pushed back and stay theaters. The one though that I think at this point should just go VOD is St. Maud. Because yeah. honest, honestly, A24, their films don't bring a crowd to the theater usually. Like, no, I would agree with you. Like, if anything, they just break even. So I think this one, they should just release it on video on demand. But, like, yeah, like the big Bloomhouse, Universal, Sony Pictures. I, yeah, as much as it sucks for some of the horror fans that were really looking forward to these films. I mean, yeah, we got to wait, but at the same time, this is a good way to keep these theaters and help them and provide, and we can be the audience that provides by paying the money, going and buying the concession stands, or buying the concessions. Like, it's good for the economy that way. Yeah, I think you said probably everything that I think. I don't think I'm I'm thinking much differently than you are. I I understand the decision to hold it back because I wonder if they have information that we don't have privilege to yeah. about when theaters will actually reopen and what that will look like. And if they're worried that with COVID, there'll be such a restriction of who can attend the theaters that they won't make their money, even if it is in theaters. So yeah. if, you know, for example, I completed training for going back and I work at a university and it's going to be very selective in September of who's on campus. And a university campus, at least the one I am at, is very large. You know, it's right. bigger than a movie theater. And obviously, people can be spread out. So I'm wondering if for production companies or whatever, the distributors, they're wondering if it's worth them doing it because there's not going to be as many people in the theaters as they want. On the other side of the coin, I think we are in a situation right now, you know, we are in a, a situation where we don't want to see any more businesses go out. Like I look at Cineplex in Canada, which is our major theater chain, and I think of the people that are employed from marketing to accounting to sales to the people that run the projectors to the people that make the projectors to the people that work in concessions to the people that, you know, manage the theaters. Like there's so many jobs that go just beyond a ticker taker. Yeah. or a concessions person or a cleaner you know it's it's a big industry and in canada cineplex also owns things called rec rooms which are basically like david busters as oh, okay. well and you know i i love the theater i enjoy the theater i miss going yep. i will go when it opens i will do whatever guidelines they need me to follow to be in the theater so I will not stop supporting the theater personally because I care about the theater and I'm worried about people losing their jobs. Same here. Now like, that may happen anyway. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I was, sorry, go ahead. Scott. Uh, I, I was going to say like, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, but like that historic Howell theater, the first weekend that we got together and hung out, like I have a bad feeling that's not going to reopen. Like, well, and they may, because the small little historical ones, they may be able to get funding through other sources. Oh, that's but true. But, like, those big chains, like, I look at AMCs and, like, I don't know a lot of the chains in the United States. I yeah, know a handful. AMC, right? Regal, uh, uh, what was the other one? Uh, but, yeah. There's a bunch, right? And, and that's in a Plex in Canada. And they own a lot of the smaller chains too. Some of the chains, some of the movie theaters are still independent. Like we have a movie theater that's like the Howell theater out near me is called the Westdale. And it plays a lot of like edgy films, right? So they'll play all the new Michael Moore documentaries, not that he's produced anything, but all of them went there. Right. So like, okay. you know, that's the kind of stuff they play. So that, that stuff I'm not worried about because they could get support through other means and methods, but Cineplex relied on people going to the theater or corporations renting out that for, you know, staff trainings and stuff like that. 
and it's it's and I don't think by any sense like oh my little like dollars are going to keep everything going and you know I'm not trying to be a martyr but I just feel like yeah it sucks like it sucks I don't know if that was the right decision to make I think that probably moving forward and seeing what the world looks like in October would be a good call but let's be real here they're not going to release it in other places if they're not going to release it in the United States. So yeah. if shit is wrong with you guys, which it is. Yeah. Okay, it is. And I'm not trying to say that to be mean. No, it's, facts it's are facts absolutely. And numbers are numbers, right? Yeah. So, you know, they're looking at it and going, if main, our main gross product is going to be American, which is one of the strongest currencies in the world. Yeah, I probably wouldn't release a fucking movie either. Right. You know, like as shitty as that is, and as much as it makes me mad, and as much as I hate it, fuck, like, yeah, like, you know, and I just don't know enough details and data to understand the full decision process that was made. Um, but I do think it's disappointing. Do I personally think it's the end of the world? I can wait till next year to see Halloween Kills. Yeah. Am I sad? Of course. Of course, I would love to see it. Of course, that'd be awesome. Am I sad about it? Absolutely. Um, do I think it's the best financial decision to make? I have no idea. You know, I see pros and cons both ways. Um, and I'm really interested to see how this all falls out. And really, we're waiting on the good old United States of America. Oh, trust me. I'm waiting on the good old U.S. of A. as well. <laughs> and um, you got some states there that are doing really well. And I don't know, maybe they'll change their mind. But why would you only open in some states? Like, Because really, you would want to open in the bigger states like New York State or Florida, yeah, Florida, where there's a lot of people, like I, like California, because yeah. that's where you're going to have more people going to see the movie. Like I feel like this is an economic decision, and I don't fully understand all the factors. I'm just going from a very, very, very basic knowledge of the situation. Um, but yeah, it's 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 complicated. It really is yeah. complicated, and it's a shame. You know, it's a shame that we've been put in this situation. It's a shame that. It's a shame that this virus exists to begin with, and it's a shame that reactions have been how they have been, and you know it is what it is now. But we're dealing with the consequence. So, yep, that is very true. And I mean, as sad as it is, like I said, like I understand the decision, and you know I'm willing to wait a year because, like I say, I want to support the theater chains. Because uh, yep, like you, once the theaters are open, you're damn right, my ass could be in that seat right away. Yeah. And I'll be buying all the popcorn. I'll be like, eight popcorn bags, please. <laughs> yeah, get me, like, well, eight, eight Canadian-sized popcorn bags for you. So get me two American larges. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'll be like, I'll take a bucket. And they're going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> um, we're in Canada. We don't get buckets. Um, but, you know, and I ordered Cineplex popcorn and pop and stuff like that throughout this whole COVID thing. Yeah, you and were very lucky to have one of the was able to sell that stuff to be honest like, you why i did that was to support the theater yeah exactly like, that that's what i wanted to do for us too but can't i may even do it tonight now that i'm really craving it after i get off this call with you i may order <sighs> some uber eats and order that in tonight um because like like man like if i don't you know and i don't think by any stance my little ordering of popcorn and pop is going to be the only thing but at least i tried Right. That's it's, how I look at it. Like, at least I tried. And, you know, if they do shut down and, and theaters do have to close, at least I know I tried. Yeah, For exactly. Me, that's it's important. you helping out as best you can. Yeah. And and that's very, like, I come, I'm a very left-wing person. Okay. I'm a very socialist person. I'm sure anyone who listens to this podcast for more than five minutes knows that. Yeah. Uh, but I do understand economics and I do understand capitalism. And, you know, I don't really know if this is a wise decision. I really don't. Like, you know, I guess it's going to depend how theaters are structured. I don't know. Can they change their mind and up their release date? Like, is that a thing? Like, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that's kind of where, like, A24 was smart and just said, we're postponing it indefinitely because then they can just kind of see how things go play out. And they'll be like, okay, St. Maud's coming out now. Yeah, but couldn't any other th company do that too? I think they could, but I like, think so. What if you give a date and you move it up? You know, so like yeah, someone's gonna be like, "Oh man, I wanted to wait till 2021, October 15th." What do you mean it's coming out this year? Like, like I don't right. know. I think about with I know with the Halloween Kills one, they're using this extra time to uh, bring in some more sound guys because they're gonna. I guess they struck a deal with the theaters. They're gonna be making it an IMAX experience. Oh, fun! IMAXs so I, are fun. 
yeah, so I think that's why they, they're like, well, you know, if we're going to push it back a year, we'll spend a little more money on the sound and make it like an IMAX experience worth that having well, or whatever. let's hope that theaters are still doing that. Right. Um, yeah, I, yeah, you know, like it's, man, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year for this, but I have been happy on, on a positive note. The only thing that I can say that I've enjoyed is the VODs that I've seen. It yes. has forced me to watch movies that I would have usually watched. Um, and that's great. But I feel like there's multiple factors here that I have a general understanding of that goes deeper than what we want as horror fans. I feel like there's a lot of economic decisions that are being made here. And um a lot of them are is based on how the US is recovering, to be quite frank. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, like our borders are dependent on you guys. Like right. we have I don't want to be bragging here. We have the situation under control in Ontario. No, no, we trust right? us. Like, trust me, all of the Americans that are like looking longingly are looking longingly your way. Going, yeah. oh, we want the day that that will happen. You know, Quebec Quebec has still challenged and they have some issues still there, but like we have provinces that have moved into stage three, like that are open, that are fine, that are running, you know, that have zero cases like Nova Scotia. We have a friend that's in Nova Scotia and they had zero cases for two weeks. Yeah. And then they had like one or two cases. Like that's nothing compared to the numbers <laughs> that, you know, you guys are seeing on the daily. So I think, and of course the population in the United States is much bigger too. We got to take yeah, well, You got the population and then you got the people that are like, all about freedom right now and like just not wanting to obey the laws well and they're making choices that they feel are you know in their best interest and you know yet again when people try to compare what the environment is like here to there i i, I get pretty defensive because i'm yeah. like not even the same like, no no not it even is the not same at all thing, right so i i'm hopeful because I think a lot is waiting on the U.S. recovery, not just mm -hmm. the movie theater trains, borders opening, tourism. A lot of the world on. is waiting on the U.S. to get their shit under well, control. Well, and you guys can't go anywhere. Like, yeah. you know, for Canada, we're able to travel to Greece now. We're able to travel to other places. You know, still, you can go to the United States if you are essential. So if I was a doctor and I worked in the United States or I had a close family member, but I could be like, oh, I'm going to see Scott Crawford and we're going to go talk about horror movies. That's not an essential reason. I mean, it should be, but still. But it's not, <laughs> I know, it's right? Not. And to be quite honest with you, when I come back, I would need to quarantine for two weeks. And Scott, I love right. you, but yeah, there's like, no I, way. I wouldn't want you to do that anyways. You know, and they check up on people. Like my friend, her her husband was getting hit, was being a, like trained to be a doctor in Michigan. And he came home. They've called twice and some, some, sent someone to his house to make sure he has not left that house. Oh, wow. Like we take quarantine very seriously here. There was a couple of people that broke it and they got tickets. Yep, actually, and it was Americans, if I remember correctly, reading it. That... No, there's been some Canadians, too. Okay, because yeah, um, I remember yeah. hearing that two elderly Americans broke the quarantine and were caught walking around Toronto. Yeah, and well, and they got tickets. Like, every yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we don't, that's, and that's where you hit people. Yeah. You know, the, the smartest thing that our country did was they created bylaws, and they said, give up on parking. Who gives a shit about that? Anyone that's out in a group of more than five, anyone that's doing this, anyone that's doing that, you give them a ticket. And they did. Yeah. And they got huge revenues from that. And because people were struggling paying their property taxes, like I'm not trying to say Canada's perfect. I don't mean that at all because I don't think we're a perfect country. There's lots of things we don't do right. But I think that the way that you hit people is with their pocketbook. Yes, exactly. You like, know, that's the only we, way people change their behaviors. Yeah. Cause we can make all the uh, demands and laws that we want, but if they're not enforced, no one's going to follow them. Right. And that's really what the theaters are doing here too. They're making yeah. decisions for their, or sorry, the distribution companies are making decisions based on their pocketbook. Do I think they're the best decisions? I have no idea. I don't have enough information to make that call. No, I'm not an economist. I can't right? really look at that. <laughs> I can only think of there must be people that get paid a lot of money to look at trends here and look at what the requirements are going to be when theaters open and figuring out how they can get the biggest bang for their buck. Yeah. That's the only thing I can come to the conclusion of. But in the meantime, eventually these films will be released. I look forward to seeing them when they come out and we gotta wait, we gotta wait. Yep, I'll say, but you know, we just wait, but for now, at least we're getting a lot of good 2020 VOD releases. We are, and it's it's been great for first year challenge for someone like me yep, who really same here. 
you know, I, 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 I watched horror movies and stuff like that. And, and I tease Scott that Scott teased me about my horror movie knowledge before, but it was quite limited. And now I am seeing more films and I am doing more stuff and it is helping me expand. And I'm just talking from my own personal level here. This is my own personal experience. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens as 2020 continues. And who knows, you know, I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying to have a good outlook and we'll see how things go down. Yeah. That's all we can do right now. Just kind right. of wait and see. Right. So, yeah. But yeah, I guess that is the uh, end of our episode. I mean, it's kind of a downer note, but at the same time, like it had to be something we had to bring up. Well, and downer first world problems, right? Movies yeah, exactly. In movie theaters. Like it's, it's crummy. Eventually we'll get Halloween kills. It looks sick. You know, yeah. the teaser trailer looks really good though. I kind of, as much as I enjoyed the Halloween 2018, I can't remember. Was it Halloween 2018? Was there yeah. something else? Okay. Like I kind of thought that was enough. I'll be yeah. honest. Like, when I found out they were going to do more, I was like, uh, okay. Well, <laughs> that, that's pretty much me, because I just rolled my eyes going, okay, how long can we have Jamie Lee Curtis in these films? Halloween Kills, Halloween Ends, both just sound really dumb names. Yeah, it's not even the names. It was more like the house caught on fire with him locked in the basement. Yeah, well, <laughs> the thing, and the thing that drove me nuts, this is going to piss off Halloween fans. I'm sorry, everybody, but, uh, the thing that drove me nuts, especially leading up uh, like earlier this year, and I think it was earlier in the fall, like, yeah, because it was before I met with you. It was on uh, Cinema Beef I was talking about this, but like, mm. uh, I was talking to Gary about how I'm just like, I was so sick and tired of them going, we got the original uh, Tommy Boyle to come back for his bit role. Hey, you remember that police car that was in the first movie? We're getting that exact same car back for this movie. It's like, I don't care. Remember Nurse Betty that was in part two? Well, she's coming back. Oh my God, why? See, I don't... <laughs> see I like that shit. Like, I, I think it was, I think it was just if they would have put it in the movie and been like, everyone that's fans could have been like, oh, that's awesome. But like hearing every other news piece was about that. I'm just going, okay, I don't care anymore. Like, you guys are just really just dragging this to the ground for me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's fair. You know, I I enjoyed Halloween 2018. So I thought I. it was a lot of fun. Um, okay, The Purge 5, I could care less about. Like, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I like The Purge movies. I can wait for that one. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, like, I guess we'll see. I'm just, I'm just surprised of what they'll do. And I get it. Michael's unstoppable. Like, I, you know... It's like how I feel about Scream 5. Like, probably not to the same extreme, because at least I think Halloween kills, like, the killer is, you know, unstoppable. But, like, even with Scream 5, I'm like, well, what are they going to really do? But maybe they'll do something really creative. I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see. Yep. I'll say, like, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. But it, it could be very, uh, could be uh, one of our top films of the year when it comes out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I'll say, just got to wait and see. Gotta wait and see. Well, I guess we've wrapped up this bad boy. So thank you again for everyone's, um, I was going to say listenership. I don't even know if that's a word. I yeah, that's a, that's a word. Listenership. Um, and thank you for your positive feedback and kind words. And thank you to Dave C for always listening to us and promoting us on Exploding Heads and in the chat. Um, and thank you best. very much. You're the best, Dave C. We love you. We do. And yeah, check out some of the awesome podcasts on the Horophilia Network. I will be highlighting them each episode uh, because I think they're really awesome and I want to promote them as they enter their new phase of life, whatever that may look like. Yes, that is very true. Oh, and we have a guest spot. We were on the Rotten Roundtable with Mark Nato last week. Scott and I brought oh, the yes, knowledge right. and stumped Mr. Nato on a couple of films that he yeah, had he... not seen. That made me so proud when he's like i haven't heard of or seen this one and we're both just like yes it's like you know when you make it when you stump mark nato <laughs> right <laughs> moment of glee and then uh what else and well, we were on horror for dummies again we were we were with our boyfriends at horror for yeah. dummies it's our second date yeah tim and daniel um, who would not, who would watch out back and probably laugh at the entire fucking thing. Yep. I don't even watch it. They'd be like, what is this? What are these C words doing? I, won't, I can't even say it on our podcast. Right? <laughs> Listen to their podcast. And say it. And um, yeah, I guess that's 
that Scott coughs into the mic. You should leave that in there. Leave Dude, that, that was, in, Scott. <laughs> I, I was trying. I thought I muted it, and I realized I didn't. I'm like, son of a bitch. <laughs> son of a bitch. Give me a drink. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess that's it, my friend. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? No, I say I think that is it. Uh, I mean, yeah, thank you to everybody that's been listening to our show, and you know, and we're happy to continue doing this. And just, it's been a blast. I, I don't know what else to say. There, it's just been so much fun working with you. Yeah, we've really like developed in a short period of time. We listened to our old episode, and we sounded so like rigid, and now we're all like, "Fuck you!" No, fuck you! And like. Now we're, now, we're each our, other. now we are full on ourselves. We're not afraid <laughs> to be anybody else. <laughs> right? Talking smack and shit. It's great. But uh, our next episode, I think, I don't even know what we're doing with our next episode. I think you had some ideas that uh, Scott's been driving this ship since uh, for a little while now. So I don't know. Do you want to give a teaser of what you're thinking for next time? Yeah, I'm thinking since, you know, it's nice and sunny and summer weather is here. We'll continue with some summer horror. And I think we're going to be talking some shark films. Shark, because both of us live near ocean, so it totally yes. makes a lot of sense. We get the we get the lake sharks. Yeah, the lake sharks. That's right. Bull sharks. All the bull sharks that live near us, for yes. sure. <laughs> anyway, until next time, unpleasant dreams, my friends. Unpleasant dreams. <laughs> Thank you.